So, good afternoon, everyone. Honorable Joint Director Sri Surendra Thakur Sir, distinguished panelist, and dear participants. I, Sri Devedi, Junior Consultant, National Institute of Disaster Management, welcomes you all to this online webinar on legal framework of disaster management in India, organized by National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. The program would aim to sensitize and inform our participant about the legal framework of disaster management, its genesis and evolution in India, and also the environmental legislation in the field of disaster management. So after the Gujarat earthquake in 2001 and tsunami 2004, the union government decided to formulate a comprehensive disaster management legislation for a legal institutional framework of crisis management at all levels in the country. So with this brief idea, I would like uh, to formally start the inaugural session for today's webinar. So first of all, it is our privilege that uh, it is our privilege that Sri Surinder Thakur sir, Joint Director NITM is with us. Sri Thakur is an officer of the Central Secretariat of Service under the Government of India and having more than 30 years of experience. Currently, he is serving NITM and looking after the ch uh, charge of Joint Director. I am feeling honored to call him for the, his inaugural address and valuable thoughts about this program. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Shreyas. Thank you for having me for this webinar. So greetings from NIDM. I, on my personal behalf and, and on behalf of NIDM, welcome you all to this webinar. Particularly, I welcome our guest speakers, Dr. Subhradip Sharkar, Associate Professor, Faculty of Law, Jamia Milia Islamia, Delhi, and Advocate Chinmay Saxena, uh, uh, Advocate of Rajasthan High Court, and he has also authored a book, India Post-Independence, The Making of a Nation. And all the participants to this training program and organizers of our uh, I division of NIDM, I have the opportunity, I had rather the opportunity to deal with disaster management in the disaster management division of MHA and got a few opportunities to discuss about the success story of disaster management in India. And it is commonly accepted at international level that there are three pillars on which our disaster management success story is based. First is having a legal framework of disaster management in India. Secondly, political commit commitment. And third is resource allocation by the government of India. So this all is very common and it is happening in this country and which is helping the nation in disaster management. So if we start, I will start that the beginning of an institutional structure for disaster management can be traced in the 19th century when several famine commissions and courts were introduced by the British government. After independence, the Ministry of Agriculture established a scarcity relief division to handle work related to various natural disasters. Later on, the nomenclature was changed to the Natural Disaster Management Division and Ministry of Agriculture became the nodal ministry for disaster management in India. It was the decade of international decade for natural disaster reduction and declared by UN General Assembly in 1990. And in 1995, the National Center for Disaster Management was established within the Indian Institute of Public Administration by the Ministry of Agriculture. As a result of major disasters such as Latour earthquake 1993, the government of India constituted a high-powered committee on disaster management. The final report of the high-powered committee displayed a vision to work towards a disaster-free India by adhering to a culture of preparedness, quick response, a strategic thinking, and prevention. The second administrative reforms commission created in August 2005, submitted its third report, namely Crisis Management from Despair to Hope in September 2006, which discusses various aspects of disaster management, including the legal and institutional framework. National level legislation was the culmination of a process which started almost a decade earlier, global initiatives, international interactions, and national experiences 
served as catalyst for moving towards creating a legal framework for disaster management. The process at the national level was influenced by major disasters such as the 1999 Urissa super cyclone and the 2001 Gujarat earthquake. The 2004 Asian tsunami provided the final impetus for the enactment of the Disaster Management Act 2005, which was passed by the parliament on December 23, 2005. As per the recommendations of High Powered Committee and Second Administrative Reforms Commission, disaster management was not mentioned specifically in a subject as a subject in any of the three lists, that is central, state, and concurrent. And the parliament enacted the Disaster Management Act 2005 by invoking entry number 23, namely social security and social insurance, employment and unemployment, in the concurrent list of the Constitution of India. The Act provides for detailed legal and institutional mechanism for development and monitoring of disaster management plans related to preparedness, response, recovery, and reconstruction. It also ensures disaster mitigation and prevention measures through various departments and sectors. NIDM has been constituted under the provisions of the DM Act 2005 and has the nodal responsibilities for human resource development, capacity building training, research, documentation, and policy advocacy in the field of disaster management. There has been significant progress in our disaster risk reduction and recovery efforts with formulation of national disaster management policy in 2009 and national disaster management plan in 2016, which has been revised in 2019 on the basis of the deliberations during Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction held during March 2015 at Sendai, Japan. Presently, all our agenda and training programs are aligned with the Prime Minister's 10-point agenda on disaster risk reduction given by our Honorable Prime Minister during the Asian Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in November 2016 and SFDRR 2015-13. The details of all institutional arrangements, frameworks, and structure will be discussed by our honorable guest speakers during today's technical sessions. With these words, I hand over to Sreyas. Thank you. You're, you are muted. You're, it is mute. Oh, okay. Thank, thank you, sir, uh, for your blessings and your words of wisdom and giving us the brief idea about this program, relevance and importance. Uh, with all due respect, I would like to thank you uh, for sharing your valuable thoughts. We felt honored that you spared time for us from your busy schedule. It is our pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, we are uh, now we will move forward for our technical session. So uh, first session, uh, first session, uh, it is about the structural and legal framework of DM in India and global linkages. And before uh, starting the session, I will uh, I will request to the participant that uh, we will take all question and answer at queries after this uh, two sessions in the last. So. Uh, uh, to starting uh, before starting this session, I would like to give a brief uh, about our speaker. So this first session will be taken by Dr. Subradipta Sarkar. He is Associate Professor, Faculty of Law in Jamia Milia Islamia. And Dr. Sarkar's area of interest includes human uh, rights, disaster management, international refugee law, and health law. He holds LLM, MPhil, and PhD degrees from National Law School of University uh, of India University. NLSUI, IU, Bangalore. Recently, he has authored a book titled Disaster Management and Production of Human Rights in India uh, with reference uh, to international law and practices. He is also a research consultant with organizations such as NIDM, All India Disaster Mitigation Institute, and Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. With this brief bio, uh, over to you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, good afternoon to uh, Sri Shurender Thakurji, uh, then uh, also uh, the co-expert here, uh, Chinmay Saxena ji, 
and uh, also to Mr. Divedi, right? Uh, and and I'm grateful to NIDM for giving me this opportunity to, to share certain things about the law and uh, uh, the legal uh, legal framework, the um, background on which this uh, act came up. I will also because you know we are we are from legal fraternity, so I will also touch upon. A little bit about the court's role in this whole process, not getting into too much of details, but whenever we are talking about law, so we'll also see that, you know, what kind of role uh, the courts have uh, played, uh, but that I will, I will discuss. I will also give a uh, very uh, brief comparison with uh, USA, because we have borrowed a kind of a lot of structure from there, at least on paper, we have claimed it on a uh, few occasions on some of the reports that we can see, including uh, Thakurji mentioned about that crisis management report. There was also a mention of, of the same. And uh, then we will see that uh, some some things about the international uh, uh, world conferences that were there. So I will I will just try to pick up some linkages that which which he had. In fact, uh, Surinderji has made my job easier because there are some certain things that I was planning to say he he has already said in his uh, introductory lecture so if you can give me the uh, presentation rights i can share my slides yes sir you can share your screens okay uh, yeah i i is it visible Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay, so uh, this is as uh, as Mr. Divedi has already spoken that structural and legal framework of disaster management in India and global linkages. This is what I'm I'm going to uh, speak. So uh, just before we start, just a little uh, a brief profile of the disaster uh, means basically a disaster profile of India. And you can see that you know we are uh, a country which is prone to multiple uh, disasters, and and some of the figures which are not very encouraging that we are third in terms of reported disaster, first in terms of affected population, second in terms of disaster mortality, and CRED report says that we have had uh, 321 natural disasters between 2000 and 2019, accounting for 80,000 deaths. So this is a little scary picture on 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 that part that you no know, in spite of that thing uh, you see that you no know, till the covid 19 happened we did not take disasters that seriously we thought all the time that these are one of events that has come and gone uh, uh, in our in our lives and and some of the mega disasters that happened in our country that the bhopal gas tragedy orissa cyclone gujarat earthquake tsunami and and then floods of Uttarakhand in 2013 and it continues right and and these we are talking about apart from the COVID pandemic which we faced with most of the countries across the globe uh, this is a little brief overview which Srinandaji had already mentioned that you know if you look at the famine quotes that came up during the British rule and it around 1880s some of the famine quotes were there in fact there were famine commissions which were uh, set up at that point of time under the British rule, and then the one of the act which of, uh, often nowadays in focus is that Epidemic Diseases Act. It is also a kind of a product of that uh, time. In fact, it was uh, made in response to a plague that has engulfed our country, particularly the Bombay presidency at that point of time. And and then it went on uh, with certain administrative. Uh, uh, measures that were taken and one of the important uh, measure truly was in 1999 it was after the orissa super cyclone that the government of india had uh, uh, established this high powered committee to make certain institutional reforms and they had suggested a national calamity uh, management act and with that also there were model state acts which was there in their report uh, that in HPC uh, report that was there and subsequently what, which uh, what happened was that some states like Gujarat, Bihar, Uttar uh, Pradesh and that time Uttaranchal they came up with their own state legislation in one of the thing is that that the Gujarat legislation which came up in 2003 
was one of the better legislation of that uh, time if we uh, look at uh, the uh, those legislation so this this act uh, that was supposedly drafted during Bajpayee's government right but it was again under a lot of consideration at all once this tsunami happened in 2004 then what happened was that we kind of uh, enacted uh, this uh, this particular uh, uh, law uh, we passed this bill and as uh, uh, as already mentioned about this one that entry uh, 23 of the uh, list 3 of seventh schedule of the constitution we have invoked this one now this is also a kind of common misconception that i have i have kind of uh, seen in uh, many of the write ups of many people they think that you know it was done under entry 97 of list 1 which is a residuary power which is not the case it was under list 3 uh, of this which is a concurrent list and list 1 is the union list just i am telling this one considering that there may be people who are not from uh, law background so that's why I'm, I'm mentioning this one and one thing is that that when this pandemic happened so what happened was that there was a declaration of disasters there is no specific provision for that one so when march 14 2022 when this uh, pandemic was declared as a notified disaster under this act so uh, this is the first time that this act was implemented uh, uh, pan india uh, for uh, uh, to get this uh, entire mechanism for disaster management work uh, after this uh, this pandemic hit uh, this is the uh, kind of a uh, uh, this uh, whole structure that uh, uh, generally we had uh, before the disaster management uh, act came in and you can see that there are all line departments that we call uh, call them at the district level and all under the uh, supervision of the district collectors then there the state level which there is state relief commissioner and and uh, uh, you can see this terminologies in fact it continues till today because disaster management was something which was already always considered as something as a reactive process so this uh, that's why we had these relief commissioners at the state level and also central level. So for all these uh, ab about uh, deployment of personnel uh, uh, and and uh, making funds available, so all these important decisions to be taken. This is the kind of a three tier hierarchy which was which was there uh, before 2005 at Kemi. Now the fact is that that this is not being discontinued, but what has happened is that the 2005 Act has supplemented with uh, with certain other uh, authorities that that you can see that uh, NDMA, SDMA, and and the District Disaster Management Authority. They are there. There are National Executive Committee, uh, uh, State Level Executive Committee. Then NIDM is also a statutory body under this Act, and then there is. A disaster response force so there is a linkage with this already existing uh, one that we have we have seen so this is kind of an unification of both these systems together after this 2005 act has come so what i will do is that i will go uh, now in my presentation i will uh, discuss a little, briefly about all these bodies that has come up under this uh, uh, legislation before we do that one let us see what exactly disaster mean within this uh, means under this disaster management act so section 2f of that act say that it is a catastrophe uh, mishap calamity any kind of these things which can be of a natural uh, uh, which can be there of natural or man made causes by accident or ne negligence which is causing a substantial loss of uh, life and property and also importantly it also says that which the next uh, uh, presentation i hope is uh, that is something which is uh, uh, with uh, deals with with the environmental issues so it does say that it is damage and degradation to the environment and which is beyond the coping capacity of the community affected uh, so the uh, definition of disaster is quite uh, um, uh, very large in this scope under that uh, very particular act and, and then there was a lot of uh, discussion that was going on that uh, after the COVID happened that whether COVID can be considered a disaster under this act some people said no but 
I, I disagree with that one for two accounts. One is that there is no better substitute. And second is that once you have declared the pandemic as a disaster under this act, so the whole mechanism of uh, under the Disaster Management Act could have been triggered after this one. So they're, they're not uh, having the pandemic inside this uh, definition serves no better purpose. Uh, this is also what we call disaster management and you see this one, it always say a continuous and integrated process of planning, organizing and uh, implementing this one. So you see this one that for, for this kind of things, it is not that uh, it uh, required to be uh, like, uh, it, it is not that a disaster management starts with the uh, with a disaster, it will go on. It's like a cycle. So it, it goes on uh, without even disasters happening. Say, for example, if we are today uh, doing, uh, 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 making a uh, more disaster resilient uh, housing, uh, right? So that is eventually a part of disaster management that when it is kind of a mitigation strategy that we can say that we are better prepared if in case a disaster uh, strikes. So it's it's a kind of a continuous cycle. Uh, this is about the National Disaster Management Authority. It's a 10-member uh, body and it functions uh, under the chairmanship of the prime minister and uh, nine are to be uh, nominated by the prime minister. Now, uh, if uh, it is, uh, I have highlighted this nominated thing because I will come back to that one at some point of time. Uh, so. Uh, 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 one plus nine, that's the body that the maximum number of people that can happen uh, be there. Uh, it is the apex body to lay down plan, policies, guidelines, and uh, ensure effective response. And the chair uh, chairperson is also vested with uh, emergency uh, power. Uh, there is also a national executive committee, which is a high power uh, committee with uh, uh, secretaries of different departments. They are supposed to uh, assist uh, uh, the in, in, in DMA uh, in this uh, one uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, that uh, and and they have a kind of it is it is a. Uh, kind of uh, uh, coordinating and a monitoring. Uh, it's a kind of a coordinating and a monitoring uh, body. So they also have the power uh, 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 power to issue certain guidelines and 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 directions uh, for uh, to ministries and governments. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the uh, that is the work of this NEC uh, that was there. In fact. I would tell you that all the uh, COVID guidelines that we were getting was from the NEC uh, there. Uh, I will I will refer to the provisions later on. And then we have the state disaster management authority, similar to the national disaster management authority. It is also a ten-member body under the chairmanship of the chief minister. Uh, then we have kind of a district disaster management authority. Now, unlike the other uh, bodies where there is no specific uh, qualification or any kind of requirement for being a member is mentioned. District disaster management authorities, uh, there are certain uh, 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 qualifications required to be in the district disaster management authority. The collector or the DM is the chairperson and then the elected representative of the local authority who is the co-chairperson then there is a CEO of uh, the district authority, superintendent of the police, CMO, and not two other district level officers to be appointed by the uh, state government. So that's that's what the district disaster management authority is all about. Yeah, other than that, there are also uh, other statutory bodies, as you can see, advisory bodies, executive bodies, subcommittees. Uh, that is little confusing. That you know that why there are so many bodies that has been. Uh, committees and bodies that has been uh, uh, particularly the committees has been formed under this one. In fact, uh, 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 so much so that there is a, uh, a CAG report of 2013, which talks about that even the NEC uh, did not meet for seven, eight years since the uh, inception of, uh, of the uh, act. So you can understand that, you know, what this committees and subcommittees have been doing all, all the while. And I have done some work in the state of Uttarakhand and Assam. I have seen that, you know, uh, in fact, in Uttarakhand, they don't even have an SDMA. They had this district mitigation and management center in the Autonomous Institute under the agencies of the 
department of disaster management government of uttarakhand in asdma uh, what happens is that there are there uh, there is no uh, uh, details of the members available in fact one of the thing is that we see disasters are essentially local means a particular place gets affected by the disaster and then it moves up it's basically a bottom uh, uh, up approach but what happens is that when we see so much of fanfare in the uh, establishment of the ddma but practically what happens is that when you i have visited uh, a few districts in assam few districts in 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 uttarakhand also i i stay in uh, uh, gurgaon so i have i have been to a uh, couple of districts in in haryana so everywhere what happens is that eventually the whole ddma is acting with one one person so it's it's a kind of an one man uh, army that that uh, happens so that is that is something uh, makes a little bit problematic when actually uh, disaster management is required because in some of the cases he does not even have a steno or or a helping hand to even type out things and and basically it's unmanageable and the kind of work uh that uh, that is uh, being given to him i i was just uh, wondering that you know if i can show you the uh, uh, delhi uh, disaster management authority yeah so see this is the delhi disaster management authority uh, there and if you go to who's who of this delhi disaster management authority it is only the name of the special ceo ddma that is being there there are no other details that that are provided here uh, if, if we are not talking about the whole of india we are talking about delhi and and ddma has uh, and there is organizational structure basically it it says nothing uh, uh, of the persons involved here it's just a structure that that is that is given but there is there are no places in fact you know contact us if you again go there is only one phone number that is there we really don't know who these uh, members are and all no no details have been provided uh, in this uh, uh, case uh, so, yeah. uh, so that's uh, that's a little bit uh, uh, it's a little discouraging that these kind of details need to be there on the uh, on the website uh, then we have this nidm also a kind of a uh, uh, also uh, one of the bodies under this act and and you can see that it is uh, function is research training of officials promote awareness uh, educational materials and uh, formulating plans and policies that is the uh, nidm's uh, functions here uh, then it comes to the national disaster response force and uh, there are 12 battalions which are spread across the nations and possibly this is the most visible uh, uh, the face of disaster uh, uh, disaster management in this country unfortunately before uh, uh, before this even pandemic started uh, very few people were aware even there is something called ndma that exists uh, so uh, that i think but at least ndrf has been uh, involving itself in various places so people got to know about ndrf and and they do have sometimes the fears that they come up displaying all their equipments and other things which is which is kind of good for for at least uh, uh, awareness uh, purpose also uh, then they they are, uh, are under the direction and, and control of the ndma but they also work under a command of a director general which is uh, who is appointed by the central government i have just uh, in this map you can see uh, that how are these all 12 battalions being uh, 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 kept uh, throughout the country they are established there and and they always have uh, uh, these battalions can be uh, 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 that uh, they can engage in various works in according to the adjacent areas because all these battalions what happens is that they have certain jurisdiction that they uh, uh, if any disaster happens so they will respond in in such and such area in fact one of the ndrf also had uh, gone and helped even after that japan uh, uh, tsunami and earthquake happened in 2011 
now what is the role of the government the role of the government is that he, it it's uh, it uh, works with these uh, disaster management authorities it is responsible for ground level authorities deployment of uh, personnel uh, and also in this act there is section 62 which says that you know it is lawful for the central government to issue uh, uh, directions to facilitate or assist in disaster management to all authorities and state governments are bound to comply so this the law itself this these words are uh, are there uh, so apart uh, and and i will tell you about something about this uh, 62 that uh, possibly that uh, the orders could have been made under uh, this uh, particular section also uh, that all the covid orders and guidelines that we have seen uh, so far policies plans and guidelines are concerned so we have national plan state plan district plan they have to be reviewed and updated annually so that they don't become uh, obsolete and ministries government departments they also want to uh, they are required to have their own plans now i was telling you that the ddma has a lot of uh, work to do they are supposed to compile and they are supposed to make all these plans together uh, ready for the district level now for that it requires a lot of manpower so uh, that is something which need to be looked at that's you know how we uh, empower the district disaster management authorities and in fact national plan was not there uh, and and it was uh, uh, pleaded before the court that you know 10 years have passed and there is no national plan then after this you know swaraj abhiyan uh, versus union of india this case in 2016 the government came up with the plan we also have 30 different guidelines uh, dealing with various disasters right and uh, uh, these are disaster specific guidelines and one of them is on a biological disaster which was published in 2008 uh, kind of uh, situation uh, that uh, uh, that we have so there are too many plans and policies that are there at, on 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 theoretically on on paper we do have a lot of plans and uh, policies in terms of finance you can see that there are mitigation fund there are response fund uh, uh, to the national district ministries right emergency procurement so the point is that ki we really don't require more funds in this regard there is already these are statutory funds that are created so if we want to use this fund we can always use this these things particularly there are national level funds are there in fact we should give more importance to national mitigation fund because you know, the response you can understand that you know response is more important to have mitigation rather than response we need to create a now we call it disaster risk reduction so if we are doing disaster risk reduction so risk reduction should be done through mitigation only a little bit of mention about uh, that what was the legal basis of this covid-19 uh, lockdown orders and guidelines so this you see that uh, uh, lockdown order was uh, given uh, in the exercise of this section uh, 621 uh, uh, the eye of uh, of uh, uh, this disaster uh, act which says that the ndma can do uh, uh, can uh, for for the purpose of disaster response and management they can do such other measures and it was a kind of a residuary measure this as i as i told you that this is uh, we don't have a very specific uh, mm, provision with regarding to the declaration of disaster that this is very different from from for example in us us what they have is that there is a specific uh, provision uh, they have a law called stafford act which is their main disaster act and there what happens is that there is a provision where the president can declare a disaster now what is the importance of that one once the president declares a disaster under that one so what happens is that the federal funds and federal personnel they get and the federal programs uh, uh, gets kick started uh, and uh, for the whole they don't call it disaster management they call it their emergency management so there is uh, some uh, uh, body called fema which is federal emergency management agency which can get itself uh, mm, uh, like involved in this one so that's that's just a 
uh, analogy that I wanted to bring uh, about that we don't have a specific uh, uh, section in that act which declares a disaster. Then what happened was that he, that I was telling you about the NEC that Home Secretary as the chairperson of NEC under the section two. Uh, 10 to L of the act issued these directions and uh, guidelines in response of the disaster, disaster threatening situation and called for strict implementation. So this is this is uh, where our disaster, all these lockdown orders and guidelines came up. Uh, so and and all these uh, order, uh, that orders which were issued from time to time in for two two years time. Uh, you see that there was a lot of uh, legal action that was com contemplated under the Disaster Management Act, which I will mention, and also Section 188 of IPC. This became suddenly very famous, right? It is all about disobedience to follow orders of uh, uh, public servant. It's it's an innocuous uh, provision, not that uh, very you know that that it's at uh, six months is their uh, imprisonment maximum. It's a, no a non cognizable offense and that. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, that that is kind of uh, uh, thing, but suddenly it 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 became very uh, famous. Uh, so that's the, in cases of non-compliance. Now these are some of the uh, offenses and prosecutions you might have found them in the lockdown orders also. So some of the offenses that were there was obstruction in in the work of any official. Uh, uh, the uh, refusal to comply with any direction of the government authorities. So basically, we did not require even one 188 because this this were very much uh, there. Uh, uh, then misappropriation of money and materials meant for uh, 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 relief, false claim with regard to disaster losses, and also uh, uh, also what uh, happens is that he, it also uh, makes or circulates if uh, a false alarm or warning. Uh, am I audible? Okay. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, with uh, with this also the uh, with with this regard only the government went to the Supreme Court uh, saying that you know the media report against media reporting. But I think the Supreme Court rightly rejected it that no you cannot all the time all the news items cannot be always uh, uh, be there with government permission only and they said that it would be amounting to pre censorship all these offenses they are non cognizable offenses and billable and with an imprisonment of uh, uh, one or two years of imprisonment uh, then it comes to certain prosecutions against the authorities uh, means uh, here the government uh, officials if they kind of Yes, we have lost the connection. Yeah, I think the sound is not coming. Yes. Uh, let me let me contact with him. Let me Sir, connection is lost, sir. Connection cut gaya bhi. Haan, network sir, aapka sir, internet chala gaya hai. Please, ek bar check kar lije, sir. Yeah, we can wait. He will join in a five minutes. Participants, you can ask your questions in the chat box or in the Q and A section, uh, which we will take after both these sessions. And after the sessions, uh, I will put all of you in the panelist, and you can directly ask the questions as well. So just wait uh, for the presentations, and then you can ask your queries.
am i am yes, i back sir. yes sir yes sir oh, no, okay, okay. i i could see that you now the wifi was uh, gone okay no uh, sure, sir. Uh, yeah so yeah yes, you can yes, see sir. my slides yes yeah. sir yeah so uh, uh, this uh, and and any person so uh, basically uh, government officials cannot be prosecuted without uh, previous sanction and uh, they can only be done by government officials or by the Uh, uh, di uh disaster management authorities and any person if he wants to uh, give any uh, 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 bring any action so that has to, that person has to give a uh, uh, notice of minimum 30 days of that alleged offenses there are few other provisions which are there like provision of discrimination false warning with regard to uh, government officials but they cannot no one can be prosecuted for that one and one more thing was that one kind of uh, immunity that has been given to the government officials is that the, that actions can be only be done in the supreme court and the high courts and not in the district court and finally this act has an overriding impact uh, 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 over uh, overriding impact over uh, this uh, 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 on on the uh other laws that that are uh, that are there right so that's that's uh, that are some other important uh, you can say that uh, 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 important aspects of this legislation now i just want to come a little bit with the uh, indian judiciary that what role it has played that we all know that they have earned a worldwide fame on human rights fundamental rights all these issues uh, article 21 which is right to life and liberty that has been expanded to a large extent but unfortunately this disaster management and disaster victims have not captured their imaginations very well and some of the litigations which has come is only in the covid time not before that one in way uh, there are also uh, an an only thing that was available to us was about the expressia compensation and most of this expressia compensation was about the sweet will of the state whatever they did that Uh, you know, at many different points of time that they would to uh, used to do, but it was all about out of gratuitous payment and not as a matter of right. Uh, the judicial insensitivity that you can see in terms of Bhopal gas uh, disaster that itself could be a, a topic of discussion. That what the Supreme Court did in that uh, kind of thing. In in fact, it became a judicial disaster in my opinion uh, then there was an upar uh, fire tragedy which it happened in delhi which killed almost 100 or people so the court were more compassionate towards the ansal brothers who were uh, who were the owners of the cinema hall and they are i must say that the judiciary is single handedly responsible for creating a sense of impunity among perpetrators aaj ke date tak whether it is building collapse bridge collapse house fire uh, uh, hospital fire anything that goes there none of them get punished and this upar uh, 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 cinema case is one of the bad precedent that the supreme court has has kind of uh, put up then there was a kumbakonam school fire disaster in tamil nadu the one of the bright thing in that one was that, that the trial court was very strict with re, uh, regard to punishing and imposing hefty fines in fact to the extent that the founders of the school uh, they had given life imprisonment even there but when it went to the madras high court the madras high court acquitted them this is something which i want to read out that there is some uh, uh, book called trial by fire by nilam krishnamurti and uh, shekhar krishnamurti and in this one the nilam krishnamurti writes about this one that she had she was in the forefront in this upar fire case and she lost two of her young children there and and she writes in one place that i regret of having pursued the upar case so vigorously for 19 years i should have just shot those responsible for the death of my uh, children and 57 others and uh, i would have been pleaded insanity and even if she is saying that even if i was found guilty by now i would have served uh, uh, have finished serving my sentence as well
so this is like you know that how the victims of disasters have felt because of courts actions uh, is uh, there are uh, few judgments which of course stands apart one is that i like this judgment is the bipin chandra diwan versus state of gujarat this is in the post gujarat earthquake case that it was a pil filed with regard to the uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, improper management of funds that came uh, came there and the court uh, the gujarat high court in this case said that say, it's a welfare state and the donors and victims has a right to seek direction for proper utilization of resources so article 21 then it was said that it's a repository of all human rights and what they did was that they said that the people had a right of assistance in calamity uh, those uh, those who are suffering right so this was a uh, there are many other things that this uh, case actually uh, said it's in my opinion this is one of the uh, best jurisprudential uh, development that we can think in in terms of uh, indian judiciary is uh, concerned uh, there are a couple of ngt case also uh, right i think it is more to do with environmental issues uh, right that in it uh, both these cases happen in post uh, 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 that uttarakhand uh, uh, uttarakhand floods and then they basically said that look these are disasters and they made the hotel uh, author, uh, hotel people and uh, uh, the uh, hydropower authorities they responsible uh, they make them responsible for for this disaster he said that this is not just a natural disaster you have accelerated this one for example in case of this hydropower they said we were uh, depositing this muck which was there and that reduced the river bed so the river could not have hold that uh, water that it would have originally uh, hold so that also contributed to a massive flooding uh, then just a uh, few references of the us system as i was uh, mentioning it here that this is the legislative and the administrative development that happened way back in 1803 they had some laws that came up with regard to fire particularly in the port areas and then they have a major act called stafford act which is kind of our dm act is a very comprehensive legislation and fema that the federal management emergency management agency is their main body which is equivalent to our ndma and imagine that one that fema has almost 15000 employees working it's, it's a massive uh, department there and there are lots of victim assistance program that is there in us like i've mentioned some of them uh, uh, household programs individual and household programs national flood insurance program in fact nfip is one of the largest flood insurance program across the globe uh, then they had equal uh, uh, office of equal rights that they promote equal access uh, non discrimination thing and one of the good thing about it is that na uh, disaster ca case management program this is very uh, much uh, towards the individual victims of disaster so they can have a case file and they can see that what has happened in, uh, with regard to each of the individuals there and then there are uh, also this young lawyers division of the american bar association which provide free legal aid to the deprived victims of disaster and just just a little bit of analogy from from america that i want to give uh, this is regarding the world conferences that we were talking about on disaster uh, risk reduction so this comes under the agencies of the un uh, and it is a series of UN conferences on disaster and uh, climate risk management. So please look at this one from relief to disaster management. We are now talking about disaster risk management. Uh, and this has happened three times and all these three times happened in Japan, that Yokohama in 1994, Haigo in uh, 2005 and then Sendai in 2015. Uh, uh, so, and, and then there is a UN Office of Disaster Risk Reduction that serves as a coordination body for the conferences. And one of the uh, striking feature about these conferences are that, that this is, uh, uh, this is not only about uh, kind of uh, uh, conferences which bring state parties together. They also talks about NGO, civil society, private, uh, 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 private sector, uh, mm, uh, uh, parties, all, all of them, uh, or, mm, 
uh, all of them are uh, are uh, are there about these world conferences a little bit about this sendai framework which is now in vogue right uh, and as the they have adopted a sendai framework of disaster risk reduction that the between 2015 and uh, 2030 and it says that the state do have a primary role on disaster risk but there is also a shared responsibility it means the state alone cannot do everything so other other stakeholders like the local government private sector other stakeholders they need to be there also they came up with this concept called build back better now this is uh, something which which is about uh, 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 sound is okay yes sir it is okay 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 uh, so uh, uh, that uh, this uh, this is uh, that uh, the uh, BBB uh, strategy that has been also incorporated in our uh, our own disaster management plan of 2019 because it was after the Sendai that we have uh, prepared this one and you see this one that these are measures which is restoration of physical infrastructure social systems and reviving our livelihood economy all these things that they they uh, they want to emphasize that you know next time when we build it we build it better so that is this bbb approach that that is there so there are some organizational changes uh, so uh, and and uh, uh, even uh, sundarji was mentioning about this one that comprehensive program that is being today in is trying to uh, adopt many of the things that has been discussed in sendai though sendai is not a binding thing but it's kind of a guideline uh, it, you can see it's it's a kind of a uh, uh, guide uh, guidance that we are pro, uh, uh, getting for our future development in terms of uh, disaster management uh, in 2015 i have to mention this one that you know a task force of the government of india had uh, kind of uh, was uh, their instituted to uh, suggest some changes in the structure of the disaster management authorities about the act one of the thing that uh, they had suggested is that from nine uh, members they wanted them to uh, reduce them to uh, like uh, four uh, 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 four and and include the ministry of home defense finance agriculture urban development that as an ex officio so instead of nine full time members they need to have that one but one thing i have to tell uh, here is that before 2014 there was a vice chairperson used to be there in ndma after that one that has been uh, discontinued in fact there was uh, mr sashidhar reddy was the vice chairperson and he used to uh, kind of the vice chairperson used to be uh, the main person there because obviously the prime minister cannot be there everywhere so it was kind of a delegated authority that it was then but uh, for some reason for whatever uh, uh, reasons that that has been discontinued as of now we don't have a vice chairperson since 2014 and also one more thing that they said was that the selection of members in this one had to be done through an open and transparent process this is this is that's why if you remember that once i uh, mentioned that it is only nominated by the chief minister or the prime minister so there is no as such any requirement attached to that one right uh, it is it is always important to have some objective standard for uh, uh, there to be uh, put in in place uh, uh, before we go and nom uh, uh, we appoint somebody so there is obviously there was a apprehension there is always an apprehension of politics in appointment and decision making process same goes with the sdma also so eventually uh, that uh, 
we have when we talk about these things at the end we have certain expectations right i don't know whether we should call them great expectations but yes some expectations are there that we require more disaster fitness i am from the for this much of it even act also properly uh, before this uh, thing happened so that is a lot of awareness about this whole act is required uh, in the legal fraternity and also otherwise right and the state uh, and district disaster management authorities as i told you that they require serious reforms i just showed you the uh, situation in uh, district disaster management uh, uh, sorry delhi Dis uh, state disaster management authority that is not very encouraging in fact i tell you i did not show the other page where it is about uh, that uh, about Uh, Delhi Dis uh, State Disaster Dis uh, Management Authority, and it talks about the Twitter handle. What is the Twitter handle there? That is being boldly written. We don't require that as a bold at the very beginning. That could be somewhere down. There, we require more the names of the people there. The, what are the phone numbers and all. Uh, so that that are more important. And as I told you, that you know a, a very uh, hazardous state like uh, Uttarakhand does not even have a. Uh, state disaster management authority there are uh, no sidms that there is an nidm but there are no sidm uh, so it is also required that you know at the state level there are similar organizations where this district uh, uh, level uh, people and the state level people are also being uh, given all these uh, training programs other awareness uh, building program advocacy programs uh, accountability Uh, I, I I was uh, telling you that I'm I'm very depressed about the role of the courts in this one. That uh, whether it is a natural disaster, man-made disasters, I don't know whether the distinction itself holds any good. But uh, accountability is is very important, and and this itself is a big. Problem like from from the floods to Uttarakhand uh, mega disasters like Uttarakhand and to uh, the, some of the cases like fire and and that's why you know uh, it uh, this uh, bridge disaster has happened in Gujarat. Eventually, nobody will be punished. I can tell you from today, nobody will be punished. And if I am a lawyer. Uh, who would represent those uh, people who made that bridge? I can wriggle them out from any kind of punishment. There are enough bad instances that the Supreme Court has created to create loophole. If you, if people remember that there was a bad uh, uh, hospital fire in Kolkata where 90 patients died, nobody got punished after that one. Yeah, they may be inside the prison for some time, lock up, get bail, and that's it. that's the, that would be the end of the story uh, disaster management required there is serious political attention i'm telling you in uh, in in us because of failure to uh, respond properly had made uh, fema directors come and respond before congressional bodies right they were inquired about this one that why you failed about this one in our case it did not even happen and some people who even do good jobs they are removed for example in kerala that uh, selaja madam who was doing the health minister was doing a uh, good job uh, there was a reshuffling of of uh, of the uh, um, uh, cabinet and she was removed and the chief minister's son in law was put up there uh, and one the last thing is that that the covid has brought disaster management in the core area so let this journey continue and not to die Uh, uh die somewhere uh, there so that is that is uh, that is so uh, im important uh, for for us uh, to uh, for for uh, for our future as well so that's that's from my part so thank you uh, only one thing i want to add is that if there is uh, one or two questions i can take because i have a meeting then i have to go uh so i'll not be there for that uh, okay. question okay. answer session okay okay sir so uh, participant if anyone have any queries or any questions or anyone who want to discuss with sir something yeah uh, Ma manindra shah uh, manindra shah you are unmute you can ask directly now hello hello is it audible Hi. yes 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 Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, my question is like, Odisha is very prone to disaster every year, hit by one or other 
uh, cyclone or kind of thing. So there are uh, institutions and all these things. But what about the remedy a victim gets uh, from uh, kind of uh, any judiciary or legal system? We all talk about the management and all, but what after uh, the uh, what part of the victims uh, how they get uh, the legal justice or uh... yeah uh, so uh, one is that uh, uh, manindra that uh, one thing is that you have actually put up one a better example from india in fact the cm in that uh, uh, means uh, 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 navin patnaik is supposed to be one of the better uh, cm when it comes to disaster management because he has given a lot of emphasis on this one and you can you have seen the difference that they have made from 1999 orissa cyclone to some th like filing uh, when it came where in 1999 there were around 10000 victims in filing when it happened it was less than 100 so lot of work has been done in orissa particularly this is an exceptional state in that one so far that uh, as i told you that in terms of the remedies that the victims are getting the there are certain things even the ni uh, ndma has certain norms of assistance that are there right it is supposed to be taken up and uh, they are supposed to get those uh, uh, compensation at an early stage but i have seen in assam the assessment itself takes sometime a year year and a half so the process is very slow but the process is there in 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 place the only thing is that ki how fast we can do that one now that is that is within the you know government domain to uh, do that one in terms of uh, uh, in 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 terms of uh, providing this relief right so it it is there I mean, the, the norms are there uh, there the only thing is that you can go to the court and you can ask to expedite uh, that one but the only other other issue that i was saying that i'm pretty uh, unhappy with the courts approach that courts have not taken this victims assistance issues uh, very well uh, thank you so much sir sir another question is written in the q and a section by the vinod he is asking that whether victims affected in forest fire is getting any compensation mm -hmm. uh, from government of india is any legal framework available for forest fire victims also there is no see there there are no uh, separate uh, uh, one for uh, forest fire but uh, in uh, in fact there are certain uh, you see this one that even after the covid also there are certain norms that has been already put up there by ndma so this there are certain norms of standard norms and standards available so people are supposed to get compensation according to that one it's a very lengthy norm that is th there in fact this covid time also the victims are getting compensation according to those norms what is there is that in terms of hilly areas there are certain uh, exceptions that has been made uh, in terms of that one but uh, all these forest fire victims are supposed to get this uh, their all these uh, assistance according to these norms that are there these norms are published in if i am not wrong in, in 2015 or so they have revised the norms in 2000 and uh 15 or 10 10 or 15 they revised those norms that so now there are revised norms for this one sir uh, one last question sir yes, uh, that is how do we strengthen the judicial system and end political interference so that's that's a see uh, it is not also about political interference i tell you about this one it is also about the judges have not been very forthcoming on this and forget about political for example look at ansals case for that matter if you in fact if you read that book right the trial by fire he, he should, and and i know her personally also by now neelam krishnamurthy so uh, uh, this uh, uh, they, they have been not being uh, they they were looking at the very nuances of law rather than their judgments were not pro victim judgments so it is not also i would not call political interference in all that time even the judges have not not been very forthcoming on this issue in fact only in uh, uh, covid 19 only we saw there are some good judgments that were made in some of the high courts also came up with uh, better judgments compared to even that time supreme court uh, right so that that i don't 
i see it's more awareness to be given and the judges need to give more importance to this disaster management issue so thank you so much sir there are few more questions but i think uh, you are or we can uh, take <laughs> yeah, we can. I can take when my meeting is at three thirty. Okay. But I am also <laughs> thinking that then the next next uh, uh, Chinmay ji is also waiting. Yeah, so yeah. So I would have loved to listen to him also. But there is a, a departmental meeting which is there at three thirty. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, I can. Uh, I can take. I can take one or two more. Uh, Vinod ji, uh, you are kind of doing discussion. You have posted three or four questions uh, that you can or directly ask. Uh, I don't think uh, there is very long question. I can read the, it. So, uh, is there, uh, sir? One question is from Vinu. He is asking that is there any mitigation approach framed by NIDM based on the disasters of the past? Uh, NIDM is not supposed to do this one. NIDM, uh, one thing NIDM can do because now uh, we can all uh, put this one before NIDM. NIDM, what they can do is that means uh, they can. Uh, uh, put together a lot of good practices that are there across the uh, uh, country, right? So I think uh, uh, he, he is the right person to take it up. Uh, so you should tell NIDM to do that one, that a lot of good practices are there. So it would be good that if all these good practices are put together in a terms of publication and it is being disseminated among people, so that could be there. But NIDM does not have this one. This has to be done by NDMA only that on, on this uh, mitigation approach. So they can only help us with uh, producing some good materials and useful materials in, in this regard. Yeah. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much thank for, you, thank, thank you. for, uh, for uh, discussing each and every aspects uh, in very detailed manner, starting from the brief you. and genesis of the disaster management in India, what are the basics and institutional setups, global frameworks, uh, organizational changes and uh, legislation, jurisdiction, everything. So thank you so much for uh, giving this very informative lecture for other participants. I hope they will benefit from this. And uh, uh, I think uh, I should move to the next session now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, moving forward, our next session is about the environmental legislation of disaster risk management, global and Indian perspective. And for this session, our speaker is Advocate Chinma Sakshina from the Rajasthan High Court. Mr. Sakshina is a third generation lawyer practicing primarily in the Rajasthan High Court, Jaipur, and the Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. Jaipur. He is a law graduate from uh, Faculty of Law University Law College, Jaipur. At a very young age, he has also written a book titled India Post Independence, The Making of a Nation, marking the occasion of the 75th anniversary of independence of India. The book is currently one of the best sellers in the, uni uh, in the uh, online platform and is very useful for the UPSC segment. So with this brief introduction, over to you Mr. Saxena. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shreyas. And I would like to thank NIDM for this opportunity uh, handed over to me uh, for speaking on the topic of environmental legislation on disaster risk management, global and Indian perspective. And I would really like to thank Mr. Sarkar for making a very wonderful PowerPoint presentation. And he has literally uh, given each and every important point from the last five to seven years, what I've witnessed in practicing as a lawyer and when I was studying law. So what I think that environmental law uh, is coming to picture more after the Bhuch earthquake, then we had the Uttarakhand floods, COVID recently, uh, many state governments and government of India had put in the 1897 Epidemics Act to place. So it has been a very uh, enlightened journey on, of environmental disaster management in India, but there's still a lot of things to learn. What most importantly, I think that uh, environmental law has to evolve in a very transparent, accountable and active way by how the courts are putting it up and how uh, state successes, state governments are putting it up. Odisha is a very good example that Sarkar sir had given and uh, people and chief consecutive state chief ministers really need to learn a lot from Sri Naveen Patnaik ji, Honorable Chief Minister of Odisha, that how the way the state is a model for people today and state governments and the government of India to learn how they're managing up their uh, disasters consecutively year after year after year. So I would first like to introduce 
uh, as per my topic, it is requiring me to comment on the global perspective. So the first part of my presentation would go for the global perspective. And then I would come into the code Indian perspective, which is the acts, DPSPs, FRs, legislations made by the government of India, DNGT, very important, not very talked about, but very important. And finally, the judicial judgments, pronouncements, and landmark cases, which mark up the environmental disaster management spirit in India. So I think environmental law is a very uh, integral and important part of any government policy and agency today. And it includes a series of laws and regulations related to pollution, water quality, air, and the environment we live in on a daily basis. It uh, might sound a, a collective term encompassing aspects of law that provide protection to the environment. And legislation, in my uh, perspective, is a very valuable tool to educate people and their responsibility because environmental uh, protection is not a one way. Thing. The government can make measures in the legislations, but people will have to also follow it up. Swachh Bharat Abhiyan is a very uh, nice perspective of making an environment clean. So you can have less diseases. There are out of pocket expenditures for hospitals are less. Apart from it, and in India, the environment makes a very important perspective in the constitution of India. And uh, the need to protect natural resources and environment and to make this a sustainable world to live in. First, a sustainable country and then a sustainable world to live in will ultimately uh, help the pop populace, the young populace, especially because they have aspirations to fulfill for the nation and will also reflect in India's constitutional framework and its international obligations because India is one of the most primarily uh, placed into uh, global linkages and international obligations, as in, for example, we have the Paris Treaty or the Kyoto Protocol or the Ramsar wetland records. So India is, I think, one of the most active participants in environmental perspectives internationally. Uh, what I think reasons for the environmental crisis for me, if I would connect to the 78 years the world has seen post World War II, is the rapid industrialization and urbanization we're seeing everywhere. You go to any city in India, you might be seeing that there are real estate constructions are coming up. Farming lands are becoming very thin and uh, rapid population growth, population control. I think it's one of the most, most important perspective. The legislature today, the Lok Sabha of India, the parliament of India will have to bring it up in a very consecutive, in a very balanced, mediated approach. Could not be just like a farm laws that you bringing some laws and you're not getting it discussed. And then there is outroar in public. So I think population control is very important to manage environmental resources in future. The more population will require more water, more sewerage management, and more trees will be cut because you will have to construct new houses. So I think that for me, population explosion is one of the most important region. Connected to it is the increased use of pesticides and insecticides you're using for, uh, for feeding people because you have so many people you will have to have a lot of people who you'll have to feed. So that also needs to be uh, controlled in a way. Apart from it, uh, I think the need for environmental legislations comes into place because you will have to control this environment pollution, ignoring the uh, political territory or the legislative jurisdiction of any place. Therefore, environmental uh, Problems are global in nature. Sir, sir, your video, your, your video just uh, not coming. I think you have stopped the video. Is it, is it, is yeah, it audible? Yeah, 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 audible and visible. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the combination of rapid industrial development uh, in concerns to strong economic growth that every nations, every countries, or every every state in India wants has substantially increased pollution emissions. So we need environmental legislation for that. The purpose of environmental legislation, legislation as I already said, is to control uh, the environmental degradation side by side. Uh, it requires business companies and corporate world to come together. We should have a balanced approach towards uh, following the legislation. Because what happens happening is today is with a neo-colonial mindset nations which are stronger enough like britain uk uh, us they're coming into uh, front to front roundtable conferences and they're not agreeing to controlling the carbon carbon emissions 
So this becomes very important that there has to be some rule of law at the part of the United Nations conferences or even in the bilateral environment conferences or the multilateral conferences, which only have 15 or 20 nations like G20, apart from businesses, they should also focus on environment protection. That I think is very important. Uh, the third aspect for me in this uh, uh, presentation would be the principles of environmental law. What principles govern environmental law? So there are four to five principles. One is sustainable development, very important, foremost in today's context that development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs is sustainable development. Firstly defined in 1972, the UN Nations Conference on Human Environment at Stockholm. Then apart from it, uh, equity is very important that the intergenerational equity is maintained for future generations to enjoy a fair level of the common environmental resources that today, today's generation is enjoying today. Third is transboundary responsibility. Every nation internationally needs to have a responsibility of not polluting the neighbor's environment or the neighbor's common EEZ, which is economic environment zone waters or the international waters. So it disturbs the environment of the subcontinent. For example, if India and Sri Lanka are neighbors, so it is the responsibility of India to maintain proper standards near its borders in the international waters also to control pollutions. Public participation and transparency is the fourth most important. And this is very special in the context of India. The Environmental Impact Assessment, EIA, has been foremostly India's most important draft that has come into place. Fifth is the polluter pay principle. It is again very important in the context of India. Uh, and PPP, I think a lot of landmark Supreme Court judgments in MC Mehta also has uh, designated that polluter, if you're you polluting the environment, you will have to pay the damages according to the state government or the laws which are being placed internationally or in India. Uh, part one will begin uh, now as I will look looking for, I'll be looking forward speaking on the global perspective of environmental legislation. The first and landmark legislation uh, you can say is the Stockholm Declaration on Human Environment in 1972, which had taken place in the UN Conference of Human Environment in Stockholm, Sweden, 1972. And in India, we have taken the right to clean environment as the fundamental right under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. So we have literally borrowed it from the uh, Human Declaration, Stockholm 1972. And uh, you can even file a writ in the High Court of Judication under 226. The five writs are mentioned. You can mention file a writ if you are not very happy with the, pres with the present environment in your state or in your district, wherever you are living in India. So this perspective of uh, and cashing the judiciary can be said from the Stockholm Declaration of Human Environment 1972. Next, I would move on to the Brutland Commission of for Environmental Law 1983. So uh, this published report, which was a common future, and it was one of the most important, uh, gave the most important concepts of sustainable development. And uh, the Brutland Commission's characterization of sustainable development is that it meets the needs of today, but it without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So they are virtually facilitating a proper use of resources, no wastage, environmental degradation should be minimized up to a limit that it does not affect the future generations to enjoy their lives because environment resources are very limited in nature. They are not unlimited, so you cannot keep thrashing the environment and taking resources out of it. You will have to conserve it for the future resources. This Brutland Commission uh, was very important. Unfortunately, it was, it was related dissolved in 1989. The third is the UNCLOS, is United Nations Convention on the Law of C 1982. So this talks about an international agreement with, between nations for uh, maritime and marine activities. It demarcates the contagious zone, the exclusive economic zone, the high seas for fishing, and it also provides the backbone for offshore governance by coastal states and those states who are littoral or who are navig navigating oceans, basically. The fourth uh, important global uh, legislation is the Ramsar Convention 1971, very important in the context of India. We have two, uh, Loktak Lake and the Kevla Deo Lake uh, in India, which are in the Mount Trish record. 
one of the important registers which India is a party to for wetland conservation. And uh, it was it is established in 1971 in Ramsar, and uh, India signed it on 1982. So uh, Ramsar site is basically a wetland which you would have to abide by its commitments of maintaining it and uh, with wise use, with proper conservation measures, not so public in interference into the place. So yeah, wetlands are very important in context of India, especially. Fifth is the Basel Convention on the control of towns, transboundary movements of hazardous waste, 1989, and comprehensive treaty to uh, aim to protect the human environment from adverse effects of hazardous waste that is generated, managed, and disposed of in the world community. India's Ministry of Consumer Affairs of Food and Public Distribution has announced a blanket ban on all types of single-use plastics. You might not be seeing a lot of plastics when you're visiting Reliance or DMART or these hyper stores uh, because of the commitment to India's commitment to Basel. Basically, and uh, sixth is the UNCED, it's the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, 1992, also known as the Rio Conference, very famous. It came out with the Agenda 21, uh, which was the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, 21 things for the future of deciding how we will go about with the environment, how we tackling environmental pollution. It also came up with the forest principles of sustainable management of forest resources in the world. And uh, it is not a binding statement. It was not a binding statement, but still, it's it's it holds a pretty much importance in context of environmental protection around the world. Uh, in the context of uh, global uh, risk management, the seventh most important thing I'd like to uh, mark its presence is the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction (UNDDR). It was created in 1999 to ensure implementation of the international strategy for disaster reduction, which is also the ISDR, and uh, it works to uh, between international nations, countries, uh, via network of international organizations, rates, phrase, funds also provides awareness, trainings to uh, commissions and different uh, states in India and abroad for disaster reduction, and it uh, follows up the current Sendai framework, which we are in the cycle of 2015, 2030. It comes out with a global assessment award and a report, which uh, is the disaster risk reduction, which the GAR monitors risk patterns and trends and progress in disaster risk reduction while proving strategic policy functions and inputs. And uh, another most important perspective is the United Nations Sasakawa Award for disaster risk reduction is awarded to an individual or institutions that have made active efforts. A lot of Indians have won it recently. And it was established by the founding chairman of the Nippon Foundation, Ryochaki Sasawaka. So this is another important internationally acclaimed award that people get if they are helping the nation or their state or their district or their place anywhere in the world for environmental conservation. Next is the UNFCC, United Framework Convention on Climate Change 1992. Climate change and disaster risk reduction, I think, is one of the most underrated topic. It is a well important topic, very well connected because if you are not managing climate change in a proper way, in a very balanced approach, then you are inviting disaster, disasters after disaster. So climate change and disaster risk management are very closely connected, very underrated, but very closely connected. The UNFCC was established in uh, 1992. They have a secretariat in board Germany, uh, which was ended on 4th and 21st March 1994. And the conference of parties, the COP50 that was recently held in Stockholm and Madrid was uh, by the convention of parties. UNFCC is the main chapter body and the convention of parties are the COPs that are happening year after year. I know the COPs are not very successful, but still it brings a lot of hope because a lot of nations, 150 plus nations are participating in it, in it internationally whenever the conference is conducted. Next is the United Nations Environment Program, uh, which is, I think, uh, one of the most important UN active programs currently, which is focusing on sustainable development and international uh, cooperation on environmental protection, uh, helping governments achieve environmental targets for reducing carbon emissions, which is their party to, as in the Kikigali Amendment to Montreal Protocol or even the Kyoto Protocol for reducing ozone emissions. So it publishes the major important uh, report, which is the emissions gap report and the global environment out outlook. 
and 50 years has been completed. It was founded in 1972, and we have just uh, completed 50 years of the UNEP. Next is the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, it is very important in context, context of uh, the global emissions, which CO2 emissions, carbon carbon emissions, which we are uh, producing. And in, I would like to take a very strong opinion that the uh, first world countries, as in the USA or UK or European Union, uh, should also take it up to reduce their emissions because they have been developing at a faster pace before us because industrialization and industrial revolution hit in UK and then US first. So they hold the major responsibilities of, I would say, destroying the environment at the first place because nations like third world nations like India or China or uh, Southeast Asian nations have less responsibility in terms of the reducing CO2 emissions because we have to, we have so much to get. We are not at as much advanced as what is happening in US or UK or Silicon Valley. So it is one of the most important uh, protocols. It's legally binding. And most important fact is only members of UNFCC can become parties to Kyoto Protocol. Not every nation can become this part. It's based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, keeping in mind the socioeconomic de development of concerned authorities, and it also supports the polluter pay principles, which I have just, just explained before. Next is the Montreal Protocol uh, for uh, reducing the uh, substances which are depleting ozone, very well connected to Kyoto. Uh, next, I would like to uh, move on to the United Nations Climate Change Conferences. Uh, the COP was the last, which I just mentioned, held at Spain, Madrid in December 2019. And India played a very important role. Uh, Our Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi went with the uh, the environment minister they argued for clarity over the promised provisions of climate finance because climate finance ways ways of by ways of raising funds through ncds or through fixed deposits is very important a lot of climate funds and esgs are working abroad what we know as mutual funds in india they are investing into climate protection funds abroad so it becomes very important and india has been always been uh, favoring efforts to boost adaptation and building capacities in poorer countries because India, India's economy has grown, I think, fourfold or tenfold, what I'm seeing from 1991 to 2022, since Manmohan Singh governments had brought uh, the LPG policies, which was liberalization, privatization, globalization. They have affected the environment, I will not say, but they've in, in fact increased India's purchasing power capacity, environmental, uh, and uh, e economical uh, situation, what we're seeing right now, we're aiming at $5 trillion economy, but we should also not forget that achieving $5 trillion economy is very good, but you will have to protect the environment for the population for times to come. Uh, the next three, the last three are the frameworks for disaster risk management, which have become very important in the world context. First was the Yokohama framework in 1994. And uh, it was majorly based on the 10 principles, which was risk assessment, disaster prevention and preparedness, planning at national, regional, bilateral, multilateral, and international levels. And uh, after it came the Yogo framework. Yogo is a city based in Japan. So there was a Yogo framework from 2005 to 2015. And uh, it was uh, focusing on uh, reducing disasters. Uh, interconnecting social, environmental, equal assets of each and every nation. It also played a very important role to strengthen the governments for disaster preparedness in their areas and subcontinent. Currently, we are in the cycle of the third framework, which is the Sendai framework from 2015 up till 2030. We still have eight years left, and it was held at the third United Nations World Conference or DRR held in Sendai Miyagi, Japan. It was again in Japan, and it aims to guide the multi-hazard management of disaster risk development across. So with this, I end the first part of uh, my presentation, which was based on uh, the global legislation. Now, one of the most favorite topics, which I'm coming back to is in the Indian perspective of what we have done, what we are doing for protecting environment and the current legislations of what we have in place. So, Article 48A, first uh, point is Article 48A, very important, Directive Principle State Policy, though not, uh, not bounded to 
you cannot you're not bounded uh, to follow both the fundamental duties and the dpsps but dpsps can be put into place by the legislation brought by uh, the parliament of india or even by the supreme court under 141 article 141 of the indian constitution so 48a says that the state shall endeavor to safeguard the country's forest and wildlife and to maintain and promote the environment it was determined by the residents of the nation that they require a basic healthy environment to survive and it was decided, decided in the landmark judgment of Sher Singh versus Himachal Pradesh. The next is the fundamental duties under 51A which addresses the fundamental obligations of citizens. From the government now they've shifted to the city citizens as a duty to protect the environment. As a result both the state 48A and every person 51A have the responsibility to preserve and improve the environment. So 48A gives a right or an obligation to the state and 51A in the fundamental duties of the Indian constitution gives a part to the Indian citizens to come forward and not, not uh, destroy the environment, not facilitate the destruction and degradation of environment, help the government in achieving environmental protection all around. Uh, legislative framework of institutional arrangement is very important in India. Uh, Sarkar sir had recently in his presentation has men mentioned the NDMA the national body uh, which is the apex body uh, chaired by the prime minister of india and the ndrf which he uh, importantly focused on the ndrf uh, was one of the bodies one of the bodies which comes under the ndma next is the nec is an important high profile ministerial members from the government of india that include two secretaries as chairperson and different secretaries from the minist different ministries as agriculture water environment ministry labor ministry who are members of this then they have the state disaster management authority. Uh, I am. I live in Rajasthan. I belong to Rajasthan, but I very profoundly I admit that I haven't heard of a very active functioning SDMA in Rajasthan. Also, uh, though we are not situated in the seismic zone, not not a very se active seismic zone, not a very important zone for any uh, threat of coastal tsunami or water, but still. Every state should have a very active SDMA in spite of the fact that they're not lying in an active seismic zone or in any area of a threat of a tsunami. So uh, the STM is headed by the chief minister and a lot of ministers and secretaries are also members of it. Different states have different uh, profile of how they're getting the SDMA done. Then comes the district disaster management authority, very effective in COVID-19. Uh, actively a lot of district magistrate, magistrates which are uh, by default IS officers, young IS officers of the UPSC Indian Administrative Services are heading this and the district collector is has heading the DDMA uh, SDMs videos are ADMs are part of it and they are helping uh, people or any uh, potent disaster threat in the district. Second most important legislation which came in 1972 was the Wildlife Protection Act. It demarcated the duties of maintaining maintaining a balance between man and the environment which is the fauna, the wildlife, and it helped become India a party to the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species, which is CITES, C-I-T-E-S, and the National Board of Wildlife, uh, headed by the, uh, chaired by the Prime Minister of India, and vice chaired by the Environment Minister, Union Environment Minister, is an advisory body to the Government of India, has been, seeks all this power from the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Next is the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974 and this act was amended in 1988 and uh, it aims to control uh, and prevent water pollution. Uh, it constitutes the Central Water Con Pollution Board, the State Pollution Board are, seeks its powers from it and this act grants powers to SPCB and the Central Pollution Board to test equipment and to take samples. A, lo uh, a lot of uh, criticism, criticism, active criticism uh, have been there for the water prevention of control pollution act because we can see uh, in Delhi, a lot of people from Delhi are connected, they can relate to Yamuna uh, because successive state governments in Delhi and government of India have failed to uh, prevent pollution in Yamuna. Then we can, we can see Ganga, we have a lot of leather industries, tanneries through the roots of Ganga, through Kanpur, Itawa, then towards the West Bengal. So they have polluted Ganga. Ganga action plan had has also been a potent failure on the part of 
not on the part of government of India, but also on the part of state governments, be it Uttar Pradesh, be it Uttarakhand, be it West Bengal, because they've not been able to successfully apply the plan. A very ambitious plan, I would say, but on the basis of implementation, a big failure on the part of governments. The next is the Air Prevention and Control Pollution Act, 1981, and uh, it sets up the Central Pollution Control Board. The Central Pollution Control Board is the same board which uh, regularizes the car emissions in India, and uh, individual state boards have also been founded under it. Air pollution becomes very important in context of the Parali, which is being burned in Punjab and Haryana, causing pollution in Delhi, and uh, Consecutively, uh, the firecrackers in Delhi have also been banned by the uh, landmark Supreme Court judgment. So, air pollution has been one of the most important factors. And the people who are not even uh, taking take consuming cigarettes uh, are even the worst hit. The people who are doing it are even worse hit, and the people not doing it are on parallel levels because the AQI levels are so so bad in Delhi. People living in Delhi uh, really bear the brunt of. Uh, the air pollution standards because uh, uh, a lot of diseases today, a lot of out of pocket expenditures are happening just because the air is not not good for people to uh, survive to live. Because cleaner environments, uh, air is one of the most air and water are one of the two most important things for any human to survive and for his family to survive. Obviously, uh, the next is the Environment Protection Act (EPA). An act passed by the Parliament of India, most important. It is passed under the, under the Article 253 of the Constitution of India and powers the Government of India to enact laws to give effect to international agreements, which I just discussed in the global perspective. And it empowers the center to take all such measures as it deems necessary in the domain of environmental protection for the nation. That empowers any person from apart from government officers to file a complaint in a court regarding any contribution to the provisions of this act. Next is the FRA, one of my favorites, but uh, sadly not being followed by governments till now, which is the Forest Rights Act. It gives deals with the rights of communities of scheduled tribes uh, and community resources because in a lot of uh, different perspective, I would take it in states like Odisha, Telangana, Chhattisgarh, parts of Madhya Pradesh, you are seeing that a uh, old communities are living, which are not very educated. They're managing the forest in a very better way than what educated people are not. In spite of the fact that they're not educated, they're managing the environment with them very nicely. So Forest Rights Act gives them uh, upper hand managing their local forest resources. Next is the National Green Tribunal. It is an act of the Parliament of India, which sets up the principal bench in Delhi. There are five constituent benches of the National Green Tribunals in Pune, Calcutta, they have a bench in uh, Bombay also. And uh, in October 2021, the Supreme Court of India declared the NGT's position as a unique forum and owed its own motto on its own motion powers to take up environmental issues across the country. Uh, Swatantar Kumar, I remember uh, being a very important uh, judge and the chair of NGT, known as the Green Judge of India, who literally took NGT to the streets of India. People were very uh, aware that what NGT is recently. So the tribunal is also not bound by the principles of law, which are the strict principles of CPC, the Code of Civil Procedures 1908. It is provided by jurisprudence, equity, natural justice, and uh, NGT has recently given way, way good judgments in perspective of environmental management in India and protection. And NGT is appreciated worldwide, not even not only in India, but even outside India. Next is the national environmental policy which was uh, published in 2006 by the government of India. It also finds its reference in the Administrative Reforms Commission ARC 2007. And it was an effort of India's commitment to clean environment. The policy also seeks to stimulate partnerships of different stakeholders, involvement of local bodies as municipal panchayati raj institutions to uh, have their say in environmental management. Next is the National Disaster Management Plan 2019. This is very recent very important and it is a dynamic document which has been period periodically improved over the years. We've had the 10 point agenda of Prime Minister in 2016 at the Asian Conference of Disaster Management in Delhi. Then we have came up with the National Disaster Management Plan NDMP, which aims to assess India's disaster risk preparedness in terms of how we are making our laws, how we are framing our policies. Are we enough 
settled are we in control of what happens if tomorrow an earthquake hits delhi or tomorrow anything happens in any state so are we really prepared so it basically you can say that what sendai framework is doing in the international perspective the national disaster management plan is doing in the indian perspective uh, i would go back to the disaster management act the foremost and important perspective the nidm the ndma the ndrf the ddma the sole and every authority in india functioning for disaster management seeks its powers from the disaster management act and i think disaster man a major incident what have what happened in india was the 2004 tsunami which laid uh, unfortunately led to a lot of thousands of people in india to lose their lives from there the government of india took a perspective no now enough is enough we'll have to bring a legislation for disaster management and uh, the ndma is laying down disaster management policies nidm is one of the constituent bodies which also seeks its powers from disaster management act 2005 uh next is the campa the compensatory afforestation fund and planning authority 2016 and uh, it seeks to mitigate the diversion of forest lands which is done for commercial purposes or construction of highways or construction of district headquarters schools public toilets or any uh, thing which any state government is doing so what campa is doing is that it is calculating Uh, a compensatory mechanism based on monetary values of the land which is or based for the environment which is historically of the environment of the nature and it's going for industrial or you know, urban uses so campa becomes also very important a compensatory afforestation is being done of the money that is is being generated by corporates or by the government and the consolidated fund of india under article 263 and 266 are uh, the sole purposes of depositing the money if any uh, state government or any corporate is coming up with an idea to divert the forest land for uh, urban purposes then they have to deposit a certain amount of money calculated by the state governments in consultation with the district magistrates in the respective districts and states so compensatory afforestation means that every time forest land is diverted for non forest purposes such as mining industry urbanization destination the user agency pays for planting forest over is an equal area of not non forest lands and very importantly that after the compensatory afforestation is done the money being deposited in the consolidated fund of india a lot of uh, environmental uh, activists and journalists have also criticized this as a way of uh, making a way for corporates and urban urban uh, real estate builders or big business magnates to just simply deposit the money and do some comp- comp- compensatory afforestation here and there get it reviewed by the state government and move through so this has been the modus operandi of a lot of states i would not say every state is doing it but a lot of states are using this practice next is the pm 10 point agenda on disaster management uh, this was done in 2016 by the honorable prime minister at the asian ministry conference in new delhi for disaster risk reduction and it has 10 points for disaster risk management building capacity local initiatives investing in risk mapping globally investing in remote sensing and gis for tracking any forthcoming disasters maybe earthquake maybe tsunamis and building on local capacity with people's connecting with panchayati raj institutions and municipalities investing in them so they can help have help people in t- in times of crisis they can support uh, this kind of disaster risk preparedness in their areas next is the ganga action plan preserve the namami gange program nmcg very important flagship program of government of india since 2014 this new ministry has been set up by a resolution of the parliament of india and the namami gange is the successor of the ganga action plan and uh, it is uh, basically comes under the ministry of jal shakti so jal shakti ministry of drinking water sanitation and ganga have clubbed into ministry of jal shakti this was this was recently done in 2019 when the second modi government took into power in 2019 this was done and the program is implemented by the national mission for clean ganga it also has it also set up the national ganga council set in 2016 which depletes the national ganga river basin authority which was the ngrba for cleanliness and it has a 20000 non lapsable centrally funded fund and corpus with currently 187 projects running for cleaning ganga from himachal uttarakhand to uttar pradesh to west bengal and all 
to Bihar and all constituent states from which the river Ganga passes. The next are uh, one of my favorites coming to the judiciary judgments relating to environmental protections vis-a-vis uh, -vis the role of Supreme Court or even the high courts in India, which include, uh, I would say, uh, the National Green Tribunal also. In Deodhar Rao versus Municipal Corporation Pune, uh, believe, uh, 1987 believed that environmental protection and destruction, which is deliberately destroying and poisoning the environment, should also be considered as amounting to violation of Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. This is the first landmark judgment. The second landmark judgment is based on environmental impact assessment. Uh, Justice Jeevan Reddy in the landmark judgment of Indian Council for Environmental Legal Action versus Union of India believed that uh, financial cost for checking mitigating damage damage protection should be laid on the hazardous substances or the people who are polluting the environment. So this Jeevan, uh, Justice Jeevan Reddy judgment of Madras High Court literally turned back to the people who were really polluting the environment. It reiterated the PPP, which was polluter place principle. The next is the MC Mehta judgment of Supreme Court, which uh, Justice E.M. Venkat Ramaya gave a famous judgment commanding the closure of a number of poisonous leather industries and tanneries working in Kanpur, Itawa, Varanasi, Mirzapur, a lot of areas, adjoining areas in Uttar Pradesh. Next is the uh, LK Kulwal versus State of Rajasthan. Rajasthan High Court held the maintaining of environment under Article 21 is the foremost important perspective of any state government to provide to an, in, to an individual in his state. Next is the MC Mehta versus the Union of India 1986 judgment, which is very important. It uh, gave the principle of absolute liability for compensating the victims of pollution caused by hazardous or inherently dangerous industries. When any person is involved in any hazardous ac activities, he shall be liable even if the defendant took necessary precautions has to be followed the safety precautions. So in this case, what I could infer is the absolute liabilities on the person who is polluting the environment or the corporate industry or any business body who is constructing an industry in any XYZ district in India, they are polluting the environment. So the responsibility is not on the people to protect themselves, but on the corporate industry or business person for protecting the environment and the people living locally. Next is the again MC Mehta versus Kamal Nath. MC Mehta has been a very important figure in Indian judiciary, especially in the Supreme Court judgments. Uh, a lot of uh, people who are law graduates are doing law would know that MC Mehta judgments are very important. People often quote these judgments in debates, in arguments across places. So public trust drop doctrine was set up in MC Mehta versus Kamal Nath, in which state governments have a responsibility to safeguard and conserve natural resources natural resources like rivers, lakes, forests, and other common property resources, which are CPRs. Uh, next is the environmental impact assessment, very important in context of India. And uh, environmental impact assessment is a tool to use to identify environmental, social, and economic impacts of any project which is functioning. It is a process of evaluating the likely environmental consequences before, prior, and for, for the time it's being made. For example, if a dam is being constructed, on a river, uh, so they will take into each and every part of how this construction of dam will affect the flora, the fauna, the people, the environment in general. It was it is backed by the 1986 Environmental Protection Act, and it aims to predict environmental impacts of at an early stage of project planning. So projects, designs, and methods can be made more sustainable. So environmental disasters are not caused because of these projects. So environmental impact assessment basically is a helping tool. It is a facilitation tool to reduce the forthcoming disasters which can occur or which can come in times to come. The EIE process involves screening, scoping, collection of baseline data and uh, impact prediction, what impacts the project will have or the, what projects the impact might have. Mitigation me me measures are there, public hearings are there, people can join in uh, at the local offices where EI consultations takes place. Recently, the EI draft 2020 uh, notification came, which has reduced the public consultation time from 30 days to 15 days now. Uh, so this has been a lot uh, criticized by people and environmental activists, journalists across India. Uh, next is public hearing decision making comes into place, monitoring and implementation of environmental management plans locally and nationally. Risk assessment, inventory, analysis, and hazard probability 
also comes into place in the IA process. Next is the environmental legislation. Uh, one of my favorite topics which I have made myself is environmental legislation as a hindrance to infrastructure growth and economic development vice versa. So a contradiction and a very famous argument which comes into place in the corporate world or you might be hearing it from your friends in on Twitter, on Facebook that uh, environmental protection hinders economic development. But I would say it's truly a contradiction. The climate problem is not caused by economic growth, but by the absence of effective public policy and effective uh, public, uh, I would say public commitment to environmental safeguard and not to uh, reduce the environmental sustainability in times to come. And basically it is the not uh, the uh, approach by state governments, but also by people, people nationally, internationally also have to be very cautious and careful in their perspectives of dealing with the environment. You cannot just go out and cut trees because you have to create a playground or a cricket pitch or you have to build a building. You will have to create green buildings. You will have to create sustainable solutions for maintaining environment also. Uh, overt capitalism, I would say, is very much uh, responsible for the fast and faster, the, has fastened the process of environmental degradation over the years. And uh, uh, sloppy management, the hunger for easy money, short term profits by uh, corporates, they've bribed here and there, polit their polit politicians, political masters, people in power abroad. This has happened in India also. Uh, I would not take names of politicians involved, but people have taken money. They have given very easy environmental clearances to operates in business houses for construction of buildings, for real estates, for shopping malls, for multiplexes, which have ultimately caused damage to the environment as, as large. In conclusion, what I would like to say is that there needs to be a balance in economic growth and sustainable development, environmental management. There is still a colonial imperial mindset which is functioning, which can be seen in international relations uh, because we can see the US pulling out of the Paris deal, what happened, the drama will happen at the uh, Paris deal. We could see that literally uh, Obama was at the brink of not doing the commitment that Trump literally walked out, that he said, no, we will be not be able to uh, uh, commit to the Paris agreement. Thus, a neo-colonial mindset will not help in achieving the balance in economic growth and environmental management. Win-win situations, a very balanced approach will have to be created so we could take care of the environment around us, most importantly. In the end, I would just like to uh, figure out some uh, perspectives when I was doing the research on uh, disaster management, a very important topic that, as Sudipta Sarkar sir also had mentioned, that there are no SIDMs functioning. There is only one NIDM which is functioning at the national level. There are no SIDMs in the state. So the states are not, I think, properly prepared. We should not uh, take Odessa as an example that every state will match Odessa's uh, way of uh, operations, but still SIDMs have to be instituted by state acts in every state. Uh, environmental courts uh, should be created because as a lawyer, as an active lawyer working at the High Court of Judicature at Jodhpur and Jaipur at Rajasthan, I have found that High courts are not taking it up uh, very actively. Uh, so high court judges are not taking it up very actively. And if you are going to file a PIL, no notices will be issued very easily. You will be very happy that you get got the notice on the first date of the court. But up, up, after the notice, the replies are coming in the courts and they're not taking environmental, very, environmental me method very seriously. A lot of times high court judges and Supreme Court judges think that environmental activists are coming for popularity. They're bringing in environmental issues. So this is a mindset, a very bad colonial precedent which has been set up. So an normal courts should also come up with a greater perspective of how they're dealing up with environmental PIS which are filed in the court of law. Next is the uh, 186 report on proposal to constitute environmental courts across states, environmental courts. We can only see five benches of NGT and the NGT in Delhi, which is working apart from it. Uh, high courts are also stuffed with a lot of work. There is criminal benches, there's civil benches, then there is miscellaneous and service rich roster. So a lot of backlog is already there in courts of law. So I think uh, environmental courts being situated in consecutive states across by the active participation of governments and bureaucrats will also create a win-win situation because you don't have to go to the high court straight away. Then you can go to an environmental court 
because it is a specialized forum, just like a consumer court, you can go to an environmental court, file a complaints, get a relief, get put some pressure on uh, the state government to abide by environment protection laws uh, across. Next is the recent Morbi Gujarat disaster, which happened, the Uttarakhand disaster, the Latur hospital fires. They, uh, the people who are behind this will never get punished, as Sarkar sir has rightly mentioned before me. That uh, in law, in literal law terms, the 304 of the Indian Penal Code is not enough. It uh, is causing death by negligence, not causing death, causing death by culpable homicide, not amounting to murder. It has a fine and it has an two, uh, imprisonment up to two years, which means that you can get relieved in one month, two months, up to two years. So if a person for example, if any engineer or any private company or any private person was involved in the Morbi Bridge incident in Gujarat, he will be only be punished for two years. Uh, he'll not be charged with mother, murder, which is IPC 302. So this approach has been taken by court. They don't do not agree to put 302, which is murder. They put 304A or 304, culpable homicide, which results to two years in imprisonment. So ultimately they walk free. They're influential, they walk free. So this approach of people who are walking free, who caused deaths of hundreds of people by these disasters should not go free. They should be punished with more rigorous imprisonment, not death, more rigorous imprisonment, I would say. And uh, it has been a great researching uh, perspective for me. And in the end, I would say that high courts and judiciary should really take, take environmental perspective in line. They should really come up with more and more uh, a transparent behavior when they're dealing with PILs in environment perspective because they are not. At current stage, I would say they're literally not doing it in a proper method. You can see the functioning of high courts. They're so bludgeoned with work. Thousands and lakhs of cases are pending in judiciary. Okay, judiciary cases pending. We don't have time to hear environmental issues. So, okay. So then we should create environmental forums, just like Consumer Protection Council or Consumer Protection Act has created Consumer Protection Courts, in which, which an additional district magistrate, ADG judicial first class magistrate is being empowered to hear the cases. You should create environmental courts separately, and the appeals of that environmental court should be strictly heard by the High Court in every state. Uh, sustainable creation, uh, solutions will only be created by this, because India, I was reading India will surpass China and sometimes in terms of population. So any minute incident, any minute disaster can cause a destruction of lakhs of lives. We have seen in COVID that uh, this has happened. And now if we are looking forward to uh, managing the environment in a sustainable way, that can also lead to less loss of lives and less out of pocket expenditures, the OOP, which is being concerned in terms of because what is happening is, for example, if you you are some you lose someone from your family, the government, state government and the government of India will give you some type of compensation, but that compensation will not compensate for the life have been, which have been lost. So I think uh, apart from it, environmental justice is also very important. Uh, governments have to be answerable to people of how they're managing the environment in the district, in the state, in every place. And uh, recently a lot of, I've seen a lot of uh, people talk about uh, conferences being organized by the environmental ministry in Delhi. Very impressive, very proactively they've come forward, but they should also create win-win uh, situations for all, all stakeholders. Uh, the most important thing I would like to say in this perspective now, uh, they've created wildlife corridors for flora and fauna uh, because uh, so, in Kane, Betwa, and Madhya Pradesh, you can find that a highway is uh, passing across, and you can see leopards and tigers which are going beneath. So, situations like these, where wildlife is, uh, in conclusion, that wildlife is uh, the precorted properly, it has been safeguarded properly, and your urbanization does not take take a seat back. So, these type of examples and these type of situations will only help us. Proactive judiciary is very important to take things forward because if the law is weak, as you can see currently, the law is very, very weak in India. I myself would like to share, I fight two uh, public interest litigations for respective uh, uh, things happening in my state in Rajasthan, but 
after getting the issue no notice is issued by the high court no proper uh, justice has been delivered to the people uh, so i think uh, i would like to conclude on this perspective that uh, sustainable management is very important and for times to come because in india we have tough times then if you are not focusing on environment currently you will have to face a lot of uh, loss of lives and some seriousness in environmental context has to be brought thank you uh, that is all from my side thank thank you so much uh, chinma for discussing all this uh, uh, frameworks from uh, global uh, global areas from international to national i think you have covered all the all the laws or all the acts from the global, global and indian perspective and after that uh, we have seen uh, a seen a different approach of disaster management uh, by by the lens of uh, uh, jurisdiction person or uh, or a law person who is handling the law so it was great to hearing you and uh, listening all these things and now i open floor uh for the question and answer and queries everyone is in the panelist and they can unmute your themselves and ask directly if they want to ask anything anyone can ask anything he is here to answer your questions wahan pe aake rahega bhai hello public hello yes yeah uh, my question is please please uh, unmute only if you have asked any question hello oh ghost sir is also here हेलो सर सर यू आर म्यूट आई थिंक ओके 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 यस 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 हेलो सर या या वी आर वेटिंग फॉर यू वी आर वेटिंग फॉर यू आई आई डोंट नो दैट यू आर इन द पार्टिसिपेंट लिस्ट ओके नो प्रॉब्लम आई थिंक बोथ द बोथ द स्पीकर्स हैव स्पोकन ऑलरेडी यस सर यस सर okay so um, uh, sir uh, you want to say something have you listened our second speaker or first speaker anyone uh no i just joined oh okay having, having marathon meeting uh, okay, in, uh, okay okay so sir i missed a uh, first speaker uh, sarkar sir left us after the uh, their presentation because uh, he had some meeting also so okay, after the okay. presentation and some taking some questions he left okay okay and then yeah, this, is, yeah. is very much uh, having a lot of things uh, from the disaster law exactly Aspects. and then then we had mr chinma saxena and he discussed all about uh, we have uh, seen a different approach how uh, how a uh, legislative person see the uh, environment and disaster so that was uh-huh. also very interesting sir so okay. now i opened the floor for the question and answer i moved all the participant in the panelist and uh, yeah. requested them yeah. to ask if they have any questions so participant anyone have any question they can ask yeah come on all of you you are no more silent ha huh? so all have been made into <laughs> yes yes panelist. yes sir so my concern is like you know as we know very well and if you will listen from the uh, sarkar sir like you know there have been a lots of uh, 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 say lacuna uh, because uh, if, when there is a pressure of the people uh, the government agencies uh, don't sh- show up especially when we speak about the uh, uh, the cp cb body or even the local uh, bodies uh, of the control bodies uh, police control bodies uh, they don't uh, come up come up in front and act as it is required uh, even in, in the environmental factor also when we see on the uh, larger perspective in the forest section or any other section uh, so in such a scenario where the india is right now in present scenario uh, uh, what is the future that we can expect because uh, if there is no uh, no super power to uh, you know uh, 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 handle them in a the right direction then uh, i think there is a big disaster that we can see uh, in an open end uh, i just need a comment on the same sir hmm saksana sir you want to say then i'll say something 
yeah i think sir uh, with time we'll have to be very more proactive with the approach we are dealing because the current approach is fundamentally not perfect uh, especially with the state governments government of india is doing its part i think post 2014 they have proactively come up uh, different organizations and stations are working consecutively day and night they are giving approaches i see mr shares the way he traveling to a lot of different cities in india he is conducting his programs nidm is coming up with new programs and approaches but successive state governments have really have to pull up their socks they'll have to come up with a better approach and a very important uh, thing which uh, could be seen was the uh, management of a disaster in covid state governments literally took a shock they were literally shocked by what was happening on the streets we could see people dying on the streets so i think uh, environment has to be taken with a lot of care in times to come as the population increases the loss of lives will increase if environmental protection is not been done okay yeah jaspal singh sahab aapne question pucha na what is, what about can you tell me about yourself sir sir i am sir myself i am a journalist uh, and i am also working on environment uh, small small issues not a bigger issues uh, in our local okay. zone uh, not okay. in a bigger manner but in a smaller zone sir okay no work is smaller whatever work that you are doing that is really uh, especially as a journalist that you have uh, whatever role that you are playing it is always worth uh, to consider yourself that you are also putting up your footprints uh, at the same time uh, that um, mai thoda uh, alag dhang se isko dekhna chahte hain uh, as uh, saksena sahab ne mention kiya hai ki whatever covid has been handled or what are the lacuna where they are then then covid also changed its uh, its phases no uh, wave one when uh, sneezing or smell sensing is, was there second and third there is nothing like that there are somehow it also has mutated in such a way that where uh, even research or all the research laboratory or even epidemiologist all got uh, means Uh, the fundamental statistics that taken up based on mass scale testing and other thing so it has uh, made a mind boggling facts entangled all together across the globe uh, and made and everything in a topsy turvy so that way no particular government or anything of course there are certain exceptions are there whatever effort it is a big lesson for us and a big lesson for everyone and every individual also the way it is being handled Uh, even before or after and the kind of preparedness that we didn't have uh, and now whatever it is it is a changing phase of life but at the same time when you see that uh, week back when um, especially you mentioned about section of survey about the environment uh, throughout the globe everybody have got their share to say something to speak something to take some measures also right sir and and, and what is important for an idm and similar kind of institution is like uh, jaspal singh uh, was looking at that we are not we are expecting something government to come up or you said that let state government come forward state government are not active enough but um, from from uh, disaster management as of now in the last few years i would see uh, that uh, especially from the viewpoint i think uh dr sharkar might have mentioned about the 15th finance commission and the kind of lacuna in funding and arrangement for the state government because ultimately you see in the first wave central government took the shot second wave onward things has been because uh, disaster management is a state subject and that way from the from our part and state has been empowered to take locally wherever whatever lockdown nationwide lockdown was not of that uh, that important in that case whatever locally that things have been done state government um, district administration all given the entire power to handle it at their own local level and whether success or failure is not the main thing main thing is uh, they showed uh, they did and there are good examples of some of the districts they came up with good examples to follow and which are all available in the social media as well as their activity and they have been given certain kind of appreciation award and attributes also 
So that way, now with the financial allocation to the state government, all the states, 36 states and UTs, through 15th Finance Commission from 2021 to next five years, the kind of allocation being made, the states are now equipped enough with the amount of money that they are supposed to spend and the kind of measures that they have to take. Because central government, it is being a state subject, central government can allocate some money, give some guideline, broad guideline, even Disaster Management Act, Central Act, but it is all the states, even more than uh, 690 plus district, at least they have got in return some district management plan as per information out of 700 plus district. So at least that kind of momentum has been generated to the district level, even in Panchayat or village level, at least let us have certain plan, whatever, uh, uh, so that we can act accordingly. On the other hand, uh, expecting something from the government or line departments, like we have 30 plus line departments in Delhi, handling uh, air pollution or water pollution, or even distribution, even distribution of electricity, managing so many things, uh, even hospitals and uh, and uh, irrigation and so many uh, line departments are there so now with the with the kind of such kind of awareness training and uh, capacity building program that going on not only by an idm earlier we used to do this kind of product training program with the state administrative training institutes but now uh, during covid itself we have exploded into reaching to the entire country through online of course now offline uh, to all educational institution as well. So we are getting a very, very uh, good response with, and involving educational institutions in all level, especially young generations who are being motivated to take this as a future option because there is no employment. But our unemployment, we consider it is a biggest disaster. But disaster has opened up many avenues now uh, uh, that to take up these things rather than expecting from the government to come forward to clean the road or uh, uh, to clean the road or uh, take certain measures that we expect that it will clean our courtyard also. But through our interaction with the people with the, across the country, across the globe, now this is being online also. We want to see that we have to act locally so that a small, small act like cleaning the dust in our own courtyard, whatever may be, whether it is courtyard means not only on the ground, but on the rooftop also. Cleaning the dust by ourselves, rather than waiting that uh, whatever some vehicles moves around with the mist, uh, it is our own individual responsibility. And for that, uh, lots of awareness campaign uh, has been going on and led with the advent of uh, this much of Technology, know-how, communication, and I often mention about the smartphone and geolocation, live locations, and all this, and social media. Let us not expect much uh, from the government to, to take care of my own surroundings. We are now aware enough that, uh, aware enough that what actions to be taken by at our own individual level. So in that case, uh, of course, uh, there are some legality, uh, uh, are always there. What kind of legal framework has to be done, which is the main theme of uh, today's, that bringing disaster and law together, uh, that where there is a very significant role by the uh, institutions. And we are having so many knowledge institutions are there. And like NIDM is also one of the, like we are an um, umbrella organization that where we are interacting with the knowledge institution like IIT and IITs or universities and everyone. And, and so that uh, in our education curricula also, uh, disaster management uh, gets, uh, you know, proper due care, not as a subject only, rather uh, motivating the students and teachers and entire community of, uh, say, learners uh, or wisdom seekers. Uh, to take it at the, at their own individual level in line with whatever uh, national broad guidelines are given uh, like 2019 uh, at individual organization, uh, even industry level, what kind of disaster management plan to be made. There are certain framework already made, which came up in 2016 and came up in 2019. So uh, what I would like to say that whether it is cleaning of air or cleaning of water, or it is a cleaning of, they say, River Ganga or uh, 
Yamuna or drain and everything. Uh, uh, we have to come forward uh, with uh, not much with the guideline, rather cleaning the things at our individual level, taking part in a community and taking it to the uh, curricula, uh, to university schools and colleges, not simply looking at that there will be a flurry of activity in the media or social media when an event happened, which we have been doing since long, uh, for more than two, three decades. But let us make it as a necessary skill that uh, being developed across the country and across the globe also, taking it in our day-to-day -day life cycle so that we, each one of us, we have got carbon footprint, but each one of us have to have the footprint to replenish our way of life. So in that case, whatever uh, rules, regulation, guideline, and legal, illegal uh, things are there, this we have to comprehend uh, uh, at our own individual level, uh, at, at, at our own individual level, that uh, not waiting for that a new rule will come, new act will be passed, or new uh, uh, mission will be established. But it is already very much present interwoven in our society where we have to act together. I think I have become very long, but I would say uh, no, it, that, it, that it was locally. It was very beautiful. That uh, That is the, uh, I think that should be the message that everyone has some responsibility and th then only we can achieve a good environment and disaster free or disaster resilient India. If everyone uh, will take their responsibility and do the things sensibly. So thank you so much, sir. And uh, every uh, anyone uh, have any other question he can ask? Not only question, you can share your uh, some of your uh, experience as well as yes, definitely the kind of measures that uh, each one of you have taken or taking up or pleasing that you are going to do this in the name yes. of cleaning environment, cleaning dust, or even uh, cleaning water. Because that is what, if we clean the water, then air, soil, everything gets replenished. Any good example, bad example, sir, bad experience, sir. everything is welcome. It is open. Sir. Yes, sir. So, so one thing, one one more thing that I want to add like right now. Uh, is there a uh, prospect that you see in the public-private partnership in the environment industry, sir? Ah, there are so many, so many are going on. So CSR fund is, I think, might, might have been mentioned about that, which has grown into more than, I think, one lakh crore every year, where this money is getting replenished, or it is coming <laughs> I think six, seven years back, it was more than 40,000 crore. Government of India has given that CSR funding uh, can be used now even in research also. For the last two years, I think, you may be, Saxena Sahib may be knowing that. Uh, our uh, Honorable uh, Finance Minister announced that CSR fund is not only for making some kind of signboard or putting some kind of advertisement on the popular roads or other thing, but that is also that those are uh, can be or being utilized our uh, educational institution in taking up some of the research project also. So uh, in that case, uh, you see private partnership, uh, public private partnership kind of things that when you see that number of activities going on in the internet itself, uh, there's a thousands of activities going on every day. And if you see that even in Delhi, are you based in Delhi? Yes, sir. I'm from Navi Mumbai, sir. Navi Mumbai. So, if you see some of the uh, important conferences, seminar, interaction, and dialogue going on, and the kind of uh, going on, especially in the uh, environment, and the kind of measures being taken up by many of the municipalities uh, to clean the drain, especially Mumbai uh, Municipal Corporation, you can see that uh, this Miti River. Uh, replenishment projects and the kind of partnership that they have done with Bombay University and the kind of contribution that made by IIT uh, Bombay, which I know at least, and Tata Institute of Social Science. So there are many institutions as well as individuals and NGO, INGO, and almost all UN organizations uh, that international uh, groups, they are very much present in most of the metro cities, even smaller cities. And many of the European countries also, uh, whether it is GIZ 
or uh, or even uh, swiss development corporation netherlands and many many such uh, organization they have taken up many such capacity building helping government in line with the government like ministry of urban development and provide uh, uh, so housing and urban development they have embarked upon many such joint project in line with uh, government of india and other organizations even in the state and selecting many of the cities uh, to to make it as a, some of the uh, you know helping them to develop the document or develop the guideline and taking up some pilot projects so i would say that there are hundreds of organizations working uh, uh, in the country uh, with the funding from outside and funding from individual funding from some of the uh, volunteer uh, rather organization and also uh, this uh, through csr funding from various industries so a lot of work is going on especially in replenish uh, in taking care of the environment so you can see that uh, some of the uh, like in Navi mumbai or if you see uh, that India Habitat Center or India Intelligence Center or many of these uh, conference center, you can see their website uh, that how many uh, such interactions are going on. Even many awards are being uh, instituted this time in the last two, three years. Uh, disaster Management Award related things so that people get encouraged. Like uh, even some kind of like uh, this bridge has broken, but there are now through social media, online and offline and hybrid mode, Many of the professional engineers and organi organization, they are now looking into discussing it. Earlier, we used to see that whatever such event happened, uh, we discuss or see that some of the experts, they are called up by a media and then they speak on that. But now there are many social media groups by many publishing organizations also, even professional organization, I can name at least 20 organizations like that, in, uh, that they discuss those things at the professional level that what went wrong what could have been, have been done without keeping uh, keeping aside all those other ramifications by you know uh, whether bureaucracy or other things but face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, discussion that what went wrong visiting the site checking that what uh, action should have been done keeping aside that what kind of blame game goes on but there are a lot flurry of activities going on uh, in fact, in civil engineering, uh, there are more than 100 organizations that who are continuously having their own registered body and they, they, con they organize uh, such conferences, seminar, discussion, forum, and then uh, those conferences comes out with uh, lots of publication as well as award again and presentation and even using uh, so experience from Japan. So Japanese scientists, they are coming in the same online platform and then uh, sharing that what is their experience. And so such kind of things are especially in November, December, January. Uh, this, these are the three, four months, even September also, uh, that were a uh, lot of such, uh, every day we receive at least uh, 20 to 30 such invite to take part, to see uh, that what is happening freely due to that most of the things are being taking place in the online. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Very valuable information, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And in fact, the kind of I would like to share to all participants are there uh, that we have got, you see, 140 crore people. And if we say that four people are living in one residential unit, so 140 divided by say five, uh, if we say to be more, so it becomes how much? Uh, it is more than uh, 25, uh, 30, uh, around yes, 30 crore, uh, 25 crore building units or residential units are there in the country. Now majority, and we have also identified that our country, not a single square inch area, square feet area is free from uh, disaster or any hazard. When we know that we have 30, uh, 25 crore building units are there, when we know all these things, then what is the current health status of those buildings? So that we have not done yet, no. 
any systematic, systematic study. So for that, now uh, we are opening up uh, one of the things that how to inspect these building units wherever we are residing, forgetting about that, uh, this office space and other things. What is their current health condition so that we can diagnose or prognose that what are the actions to be taken right now and grading them, A, B, A grade, B grade, C grade. It is not only residential units. We have got railway, we have got airport, we have got um, tunnels, we have got park, we have got canals. So there are 20, 25 such uh, infrastructures are there, like metro infrastructure. So uh, then we need to grade their current performance, not about the revenue, but the kind of care that to be taken. So for that, we need a very huge amount of manpower resources, generation. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, we do not have, not even a qualified manpower in this year. So it needs uh, again a training and capacity building of young engineers uh, who are looking for those institutes that who will uh, ensure them with a good package after they pass out or before they give their final exam. So here itself, we, we are now uh, getting ready with a building inspector or infrastructure inspector uh, who will be qualified enough to judge the health, like health inspector were there uh, uh, six, seven years back, government has taken up. So we also need a huge, like there are more than five lakh bridges are there, or uh, so many bridges are there. Even railways are having more than 30,000 bridges or something. All bridges needs, needs inspection. So for that, we need to do some systematic study, their location, identifying them on the map, Google map and other things. And currently see, rather than waiting to see that one is broken, then make a reactive action. Rather, right now, we have to take it forward that to check each and every bridges, identify them digitally, and then check their health, and then appropriate measures to be taken right now, maybe in another four years, five years, 10 years. What is the amount that money that has to be allocated? And what are the, which, which are the organization, company, and equipment uh, that have to be used? And what are the phase out? What are the phasing of these actions? This is very important because when a bridge is broken in a vital communication, you can think of the amount of loss directly and indirectly we are causing, even though there is no life loss is there for economy because entire thing country, uh, we are in a living in a global economy. So there are many things are coming up as a, I should not say it is an option, but which is an urgent necessity to look forward to see that what we are and how much that we have to contribute, how we have to uh, empathize ourselves to take care of the surroundings. I think I'm, I cannot give a concluding remark better than this. So <laughs> I will take it as a concluding remark for today's webinar. Sir, good evening, sir. Oh, sir. yeah. Sir, good evening, sir. This is Vinod uh, calling from uh, Chennai. Yeah. Ah, sir, uh, I have one query, sir. Uh, because many years you are saying that uh, because of the, the wrong uh, agriculture practice that many uh, farmers in Ariana and Chandigarh region, they are uh, burning the this one agriculture field and creating a huge uh, air pollution and uh, it is having a huge impact on uh, Delhi and uh, nearby areas. But what is the strict action taken by a government or uh, giving any counseling to such farmers to avoid these uh, practices, sir? Can you just uh, throw some light on this context? Saksana Saab, you will be better because I will yeah. speak in a different line altogether. Sure. Uh, there was one perspective in OG I would like to answer in a very uh, short perspective. There was, was one equipment being talked about when uh, Sri Amrinder Singh was the CM of Punjab before Channi ji and before Amadmi party came into power was Happy Cedar. So Ashok Gulati ji, a very renowned professor and one of the architects of this farm bills recently, which was taken back by the government, came up with the concept of a happy cedar. So they were taking the waste to the happy cedar and then they were processing it to make different products from it. But what happens is that the happy cedar, when attached to a farming tractor, becomes very expensive equipment. And the happy cedar is not made, not produced in India. 
they were importing it from some equipment from China, some equipment from Europe. So that import duty and a lot of things came into place, which uh, the happy trader equipment could not get into. Currently, seeing the population, seeing the pollution this time in Delhi, in spite of the fact that people uh, uh, people broke the law, I would not say that people abided to the law given by the uh, state government and by the Supreme Court judgment that you do not have to burst any crackers in Delhi. People still did that. But apart from leaving aside the cracker thing, leaving aside bursting the crackers in a festival like Diwali, still there was a lot of pollution, major 80% Pollution was, was in Delhi na, also sorry, ek. was being caused by uh, I think uh, the Parali problem in Punjab and Haryana, majorly in Punjab, and the government has failed literally. I have no no more uh, more words to say that it was the duty of the government in Delhi because it is the same political party power in Punjab. They had the duty to take out some measure. They could have done something. It might not be effective this year, but it could have been effective in the successful successive years to come. But they have failed to uh, reduce the happy seater concept was very good. It was argued a lot in an express published articles about awaiting the farmers. But in spite of the fact that government is not taking any measures, the farmers themselves have to take up to them because pollution causes havocs and damages to human life for everyone. It is damaging the farmer's family, the farmer's environment. It is also damaging the uh, lives of people in Delhi and NCR situated regions. So as Ghoshar has also properly mentioned that it is also not up to all the things cannot be left to government. As an individual, you have to check that what better are you contributing to environmental protection in your area, in your city, in your town, in your state. What is your contribution as a citizen of this great country that you are so farmers have to take it up to themselves. They will have to go by the preamble of this nation that all Indians, all our brothers and sisters, I will not cause pollution. I will invest more because what is happening is the Parali problem is just a ease because you just have to burn it off and the whole farm is burned off. The Parali is gone. You can collect it. You can sell it off in the markets. You can make handicrafts of it. A biodegradable fuel can be made. Uh, Shri environment, the heavy surface surface transport minister Shri Nitin Gadkari has mentioned in Nagpur a lot of uh, buses, a lot of uh, current monorails will be run by bio bio fuels like Parali and different different ethanol based fuels. So such initiatives have to be taken up by the state government because disaster is a separate thing. But if an agriculture ministry ministry respective in a state has to come up with some guidelines to stop this. Because uh, Supreme Court and Delhi High Court, Punjab High Court and Punjab Chandigarh High Court, Haryana High Court will have its limitations and implement because not any district magistrate or any superintendent of police based in a district can go to every farm and then check that if the farmer is burning it or not. Implementation of such level will require a lot of police force to stop the farmers to burn the Parali. So this has to come from inside the citizens of this country. They will have to contribute themselves. Implementation of, I, I can guarantee you that implementation of 60% of the orders passed to the Supreme Court is not made in the civil cases, even in the environmental cases, which have been done. Illegal mining is a very important issue in Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh and Mathura. But still in Rajasthan, illegal mining is going on. Politicians own mines, politicians are involved in owning mines and it's going on. So we'll have to be more accountable to ourselves. We'll have to be more accountable to the people of this nation. Corruption has to stop. We'll have to be transparent and answerable to firstly ourselves and then, then to people. So as political representatives, they will have to be very clear. Punjab has to come with a very formidable policy on what they're doing. Aam Admi Party was very uh, important in saying that we'll stop, we'll come out with a solution. But sorry to say, no solutions have been found. And contrary to the same, which was I was a bit scared about that the farmers also did not listen to the appeals made by the government of India or with the Supreme Court, they burned the Parali and you can see what was happening in Delhi this time. You cannot blame Indian festivals for doing it. Indian festivals constitute a part of the pollutions, but 80, 70, 80% pollutions are the car pollutions, car emissions and the emissions happening in Parali uh, in Punjab. Thank you, Sakshana, sir. But uh, my question is, how long are we go, going to live with this problem, sir? Because you will have to come up with some strict, I think, some Supreme Court judge like Mr. Sotantra Kumar and NGT had taken up that I will not 
I, I will not uh, a journalist I, I don't remember his name from ndtv asked them him the question that how long will you be he said i will not spare each i will take each and every one to task so this has to be taken up each and every person has responsible in government be it a minister be it a bureaucrat be it the agriculture minister have to be taken to task supreme court should proactively lay, lay down some guidelines they have laid our guidelines a lot of times in police custody cases landmark judgments have come something has to be done so moto cognizance has to be taken of this that was what is what all is happening in punjab it is reducing lives of people in delhi and cr in punjab pollution is reducing lives you we will not know the consequences right now but as you age you might find a lot of diseases a lot of cancers which are being developed young people are getting heart attacks at 35 40 liver cancers are occurring to people who have never even smoked a cigarette so these are the consequences on population you are you are destroying the future generations legislature parliament of india the supreme court of india have to proactively act the time is now you cannot leave it to time now it is already uh, people from ncr and delhi are suffering they have suffered from consecutive years i thought political power change would change it but no so i think the supreme court of india should take it up very seriously thank you sir thank you for your uh, discussion and uh, brief uh, solution so thank you sir so uh, yeah, so i think it is uh, very yes, nicely very nicely uh, Uh, uh described by all these facts and which we are to keep it in mind by saxena sir and uh, vinod ji uh, one aspect that i would like to highlight which again corroboration with the same thing that what she said by uh saxena sir is that uh, uh, there are certain measures taken in delhi uh, you are in chennai uh, certain measures like mist Uh, mist is water mist only and uh, then which is throughout the year we are seeing the last uh, one year that some vehicles pass and while we go drive the car so that those dust that which are flying at least they are being um, brought down to the ground and it is simple water uh, simple water we can see that throughout the year they have been working so that is one of the one of the very small yet direct measures to to stop the dust not to fly for few hours or maybe half an hour but at the same time we have to look at certain kind of devices or something a demonstration uh, or certain as a technology certain as a solution which are non toxic solution if you can see here this one you see this i have demonstrated in one of the webinar that this i have collected in one of the exhibition in pagati maidan 6 uh, months back uh, while visiting there so this i have added over here so what we have demonstrated here itself in my room that if if i if i make this one like this like this 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 solution can keep which i have experimented here itself in my room this solution i have got a sample here to aware the people the this is the sample if you add one part of this and 10 part of that as a, in water and and mixed up it here then when we spray these things on a dust dust will not fly for at least 4 to 5 days and this is the companies or those things they are demonstrating in the stall itself so when they are demonstrating at the stall i got attracted and i got it the sample because uh, then i got it demonstrated here itself to look into that so we have to look at that what are the new technologies and innovation coming up uh, while we are making uh, enormous effort in in uh, making the dust uh, not to fly by running those vehicle heavy vehicle uh, then we have to see that if it is only stable for uh, within half an hour it is getting again into the air so instead of half an hour we can make it to 4 5 days we can test it experiment it check it in our local level at our individual at the community level wherever it is so here again this social media and the kind of discussions that we make we also have to come forward out of our comfort that someone else will do or uh, uh, and and some regulation will come some supreme court order will come and then only we become active active probably that mental syndrome that we have to come out of that so that at individual level again uh, what kind of action to be taken and 
there may be 10 more companies or 10 more such solutions are available in the market. I have come to know one only. Second thing is the air quality index, which is being shown over here through central or state pollution control board in the state as well as in the country and across the globe, which is a heavily funded industry, I would say. And a heavy uh, got an establishment like this in the central university or some private university, they have established all those digital display of those air quality index, SOX, NOX, and PM 2.5 and other things. And which cost really a significant amount. Someone is paying for that, maybe through CSR or maybe through some funding, that central funding or state funding given to that. How much it is active or how much representative it is? Entire Delhi is 1,500 square kilometers. Now, if we put 40 of them costing significant amount, 40 of them placing in 1,500 square kilometer, you see that effectiveness of those data which is being displayed, which is no one can guarantee or no one can justify that putting 40 such instrument in 1,600 square kilometer will give a justifiable air quality index or other things. And we also know that when these things are placed in, a, in our airport, it will, it will show uh, significantly high because there are so many aircrafts are going on. So, but there are devices have come which doesn't cost even few thousand, which are carryable and which are having GPS that where it can give SOX, NOX and uh, an air quality index, even PM1 also. Uh, when we carry these devices, small devices, uh, in our pocket or in our car or wherever it is. So in a city like Delhi, when 100 or 200 or 500 of them are being distributed, and then we will get more authoritative distributed data and which is more, you know, which will not all, uh, which will also make this information more, you know, digital as well as more authentic. So that exercise uh, is to be taken up while we see that air quality index for entire Delhi 350 or 420 means it doesn't indicate like that. But in some places, while taking this data, not in 40 places or 50 places, but in thousands of places in a timely basis or interval basis, and when you put them into the same server, then we'll get more distributed one, which will be effective enough. And in that case, we can have more reliable scientific, you know, judgment on the issue of pollution, which is to be taken up. This is one aspect. Another thing is, I'm going in a, another direction because Saxena Saab has given an entire coverage of that. Another aspect is we have not done, uh, we are spending so much of time or putting every day, especially in November uh, this time, that putting a sizable portion of the front page showing that in Haryana, Punjab, or uh, in this area, how many events are, uh, someday it is 3,000 fire, um, someday it is 5,000. So we have become very much vocal and we have become visually very much active enough in counting how many fire incidents are going on right now and giving them a visual sensation to the front page with the red color that these are the number of uh, fire spots that being seen uh, uh, digitally. Uh, uh, through satellite or someone, and we are showing them as a front page newspaper. But Haryana Punjab from Delhi uh, is, is surrounded by this. How many of us, like in the previous discussion, that, uh, uh, that how communities are involved, how many of us uh, can take an effort, an approach to go to those spots which is identified? Because in our, in our Google map or Google Earth, or whenever we are sharing a live location, every one meter, two meter location is so correct that we can reach to that spot without any fail. So in that case, we have to see that we let us go there and check and convince them 10, 20, 30, 50,000, because every day lots of people we go on our uh, promotional tour or pilgrimage towards the Himalaya using the same Punjab, Haryana and all these places. So how many of us being a tourist or other thing can, can mix with those people and make them understand that please don't uh, do this thing. And, and, and there are certain other measures also taken uh, uh, that uh, 
at least convince them, make them that what is the alternative measures to be taken. Third thing is, we have got a host of scientists and scientific organization across the globe. So we have to take up that whether uh, orally locations that whichever is being shown, that is being modeled that whether that, but taking into account of all the weather parameters, especially which is stringent this time, November, December only, uh, that uh, whether we are having a very, very sophisticated model simulation that a particular area wherever this orally is being burned or burning, go to the spot, model that what is the smoke that coming up and how those smokes are traveling from that 200 kilometer, 200 kilometer away towards the Delhi NCR area. And we are able to model them to track the path of those, uh, those smoke uh, from the source of the uh, ground or field to the NCR Delhi and see that how they are being decomposed, where it is creating more such, uh, you know, concentration of that particular porali where we have spotted. So we have to come for, we have got these tools. Only thing is that uh, we have to come forward both scientifically as well as showing them some of the alternative of those things because the, they have been doing these things for the last so many years. The last so many years they have been doing and they uh, and lot of legislation and lot of individual actions are being taken. But we have to be with the reason and take some direct measures and indirect measures as well as some scientific measures and models so that you know our decision makers or those in the in the judiciary that before taking any law because Supreme Court uh, ten days back they have asked if we stop burning of this can this uh, can anyone assure or give in this court uh, with the with the authority that uh, this pollution is going to reduce a significant level so it is an open challenge to our scientific community and uh, education and research organization that who are having uh, so many tools and satellite tools and data now taken every every cubic centimeter of the space from the ground to another, uh, 50 kilometer from the ground is being taken continuously by several organizations in the country and abroad. So taking those things into our model and simulation, then our scientific domain can come forward. Uh, scientific uh, scientists can come forward with a reliable simulation, especially showing that, yes, this is from this area, uh, we have checked that this air is coming, this smoke is coming to that spot, maybe say some spot in South Delhi or something like that. So that kind of tracking of the things can be brought up into the scientific domain so that our judiciary or legislator or everyone, before they make any kind of rules or regulation or uh, things that we can be transparent enough, reliable enough, scientifically, you know, we are authoritative enough to take up uh, any such decision. Thank you very much. Thank you, Varshan. Thank you. I think uh, we should conclude now, yeah. sir. It is, it is almost five. <laughs> so I, I would like to thank our both the speakers for taking the sessions on the different topics which was related to the legal framework. Sir Kasa discussed all, all this institutional framework and how it is formed in India. And Mr. Chinma Saxena discussed all about the environmental frameworks, global and Indian, each one. And they discussed it very clearly and in a very detailed manner. And after that, we have had a great discussion with Professor Ghosh also on different topics. So this was all from today from an IDM side. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, our speakers. Thank you. Uh, Chinma Saxena, Mr. Chinma Saxena. Thank you, Sarkar, sir. He is not here, but thank you very much to him also. And thank you, Ghosh, sir, for joining in the late and uh, uh, very uh, and discussing a, uh, very interesting things with our participant. So now I'm concluding so this. On uh, behalf of NIDM, of course, on my yeah. behalf, as well as on behalf of our executive director, Taj Hassan, sir. Uh,
really thank uh, to Dr. Sarkar and Dr. Saxena for being with us on a very bonding topic. Uh, and also, uh, whatever amount we say or discuss is not uh, going to make any difference until and unless we come forward. And with that, I want to take one example there. When all these methods will not be able to rectify the air quality index to the standard level below 50 or whatever it is, then especially in this season, we have to keep on using the mask again, a good quality mask that which can again save us from the uh, pollution that uh, we are uh, inhaling through our and for that, uh, if I take an example of Japan, that in the month of March and April, when spring season starts, so the nationwide, they have a spring festival, especially it is called Sakura festival. And nationwide, they have seen that for so many years, there is a pollen attack is there. So when pollen attack is there during that period, and they cannot keep away from this festival with the Sakura, they cannot cut down the Sakura. When they cannot cut down the sakura because it is a part of their entertainment, but many, many, many thousands of them, they have to wear the mask and take sufficient protection. Even then, a significant number of Japanese, they are to stay in the hospital for days or weeks or even months because it, it makes a pollen attack. So when things are happening uh, in this manner, then when all effort will be vain, rather than eyeing one with others and making law after law and implementation and cutting down and other things, then we have to protect ourselves with the kind of uh, devices that which even when they are able to follow when they are so much advanced in the technology and industry to protect themselves using a mask, even then several billions are being spent up in the hospital for treating those pollen attacked uh, Japanese people. So in that case, uh, it has become a part and parcel of our uh, daily life. When we see that all scientific and technical and uh, legal matters are not working in that case, even our convincing the people are not helping. If that is the cause, like in this case, Sakura flower is the cause of spreading the uh, pollen, then in that case, what are the actions or what are the protections that we have to take it? One may be using this, Another may be reducing the vehicle things and other things. Those active and direct passive measures have to be part and parcel of our life. I think I have taken too much of time, but uh, I wanted to convey this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chinmaya, sir. And uh, I think uh, now we can end the session, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, every participant, for, uh, for uh, being with us during all this and uh, during all this time thank you from nidm thank you everyone yeah okay